Well, hello, everybody. And thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us uh, at this, our hybrid event. So we've got a room full of lovely people uh, joining us here in Sydney. Uh, we've also got a global audience who are joining us virtually today um, online. So thank you all very much for making the time, the effort to be with us. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that I am standing here in Sydney, Australia, on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and I'm sure we all would pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I am Ed Braddock, I'm the Chief Customer Officer with Squiz, and it is my very great honour to welcome you all to Squiz Sync 2022. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, a lot has changed with Squiz over the last couple of years, and today is an opportunity for us to be able to share that story with you, uh, what has happened over those years, but more importantly, looking out to the future and what's to come and what's in store for all of you. Um, we're going to do that by uh, going through a number of presentations this morning. We've actually got five presentations from senior people from across uh, the Squiz business. Uh, weaving that story. So there is a continuity there to that story. You'll, you'll get the, the gist of as we go through. Uh, we're also following that with some customers coming and joining us up here on stage and telling their story, uh, which I'm sure all of those will be uh, resonating strongly with you. Um, as we go through the day, I'm sure there'll be questions from all of you. We want to ensure that everybody, both here in the room and online, are getting as much value as you can from the day. As those questions are coming up, we've got a fairly tight agenda to get through today, so um, we'll see if we can answer some of them as we, as we progress. But uh, I'd encourage all of you uh, to jump onto Slido. So this is an online tool we actually use quite successfully internally for large gatherings. Uh, you can register there, uh, add your questions uh, there, you'll see other people's questions as well appearing. If we don't have a chance to get to those questions today, we'll certainly then have an opportunity to follow you up directly after the event. Yes. Where was I going? Yes. <laughs> um, just a couple, actually, uh, other bits of, of uh, housekeeping. Uh, if you've joined us uh, virtually, um, hopefully you know where your local facilities are. Uh, those in the room here, um, out through these main doors, we've just come in straight across the hall of the bathrooms. Uh, tea and coffee, obviously, out there all day, so please um, help yourselves to that. Uh, mobile phones, could we put those on silent in the room here, please? Um, as I say, there's quite a lot of speakers and, and people taking the stage and, and sharing their stories with you. Just before we kick off, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, something that's very dear to my heart, and that's customer feedback. Uh, we love hearing from you, uh, we love the opportunity to be able to cel celebrate wins with you, uh, but I think even more importantly, we like to understand where we need to improve, uh, the things we need to focus on. I just wanted to touch on a couple of that because we have been listening over the last couple of years, and taking that feedback on, and there's been great improvement um, across the business uh, for Squiz. Um, around our professional services and the projects that we uh, run with you, um, our lead time to starting new work was down to four weeks, uh, so from the point of needing a new project done with us, uh, we'll be up and running uh, within four weeks. Uh, customer satisfaction around the services that we're delivering and the quality of those services has been improving and increasing over recent months especially. Um, a few other things that we've actually been tracking longer term uh, to shout out. So major incidents, uh, we don't want them happening. Uh, this is where uh, a number of customers are affected at one time. We've been putting a lot of effort and uh, time and money, uh, especially into our data centres globally. So we've been refurbishing uh, hardware, software there. Uh, around our new SaaS environment, we have a new site reliability engineering team that we've spun up around that. And so we're seeing the results uh, and improvements being made here. Um, we're also focused on uh, those incidents that occur just for individual customers, uh, P1 or the priority one incidents. Uh, again, uh, great improvements. We've been looking at root causes, uh, uncovering uh, problems where they might lie and stopping things from happening in the first place. Uh, so um, a, a great effort on that front. 
Uh, of course, it wouldn't be technology if things don't go wrong from time to time. So when they do, though, we want to be there uh, responding and uh, resolving things as quickly as possible. Um, we hold ourselves to uh, high uh, internal SLAs, higher than what we actually have in our agreements with you, and we've been hitting those SLAs internally. So our team now for our global uh, support help desk uh, spans the globe. We've got people across New Zealand, Australia, Europe, UK, and now across the breadth of America uh, who all form that part of our 24-7 um, our help desk response. And just finally, things don't always go wrong, you just need some help. So putting in service requests with us, uh, we've uh, been really focused on how we can actually respond to you more quickly uh, and get those requests resolved more quickly. Uh, so our ticket backlog uh, has come down substantially here. We've added uh, new features into our customer care team, so that's the frontline people who are triaging tickets as they come into us from, from you. Um, uh, the, there's a new support squad there as part of that team and, uh, and dramatic improvements in terms, of, um, in terms of backlog there. Essentially, these things we just want to be foundational as part of our relationship with you. So this is just part of our core promise in terms of having platforms up and available 24-7, having our support desk on call and ready to respond, having our services delivered to you at a quality and timeliness that you expect. Uh, we don't want you worrying about that. We should be worried about that and making sure that those things are rock solid. We want you worrying about the digital services, the digital uh, experiences that you're building out for your customers. And that forms the bulk of our day today. So we want to dig into uh, the capabilities that you have in hand already, uh, what is coming in our product roadmap, and sharing some of the stories from across our customer base of people actually achieving uh, those outcomes. So with that, I'm going to welcome our first speaker and get us kicked off for the day. Uh, this is probably, I think, someone who doesn't need any introduction here. Uh, someone who's presented at pretty much every uh, Squiz major event over the last 24 years. Uh, his role has changed over the last couple of years, but he's still very much full-time and active in our global business. I'd like to welcome to the stage our co-founder and chair, John Paul Siriotovic. JP. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. Well, hello, everyone. It's lovely to see you all in person. Plenty of familiar faces and a few new ones as well, which is great. Welcome to everyone who's streaming as well. Hopefully that's the camera, so when I look at you, it's in the right place. I'd like to try to get us all aligned around two concepts this morning. The first is digital experience platform, or DXP for short, and the second is composability. They're both important terms, important because every presentation that follows assumes that we understand the same thing when I say uh, either of those terms. So what exactly is a digital experience platform? How is it different to what we have now and what problems is it meant to solve? One way to be able to explain it is to start with something I think we all understand and know, content management. So content management, I think we've all been exposed to it for some time, is a tool set that makes it easy for us to be able to publish content to the web. It evolved quite a few years ago and solved the technical problems that non-technical people had when they're saying, how do I get this information out to the wider world? It also helped organisations when organisations said, I need to manage what these people are publishing so it looks the same, it's got the same design on the outside, I've got workflows and permissions, and I, I can control the quality of what I'm publishing out to the world. Now, CMSs did a good job of that, but then the world began to get a bit more complicated. We started to get more channels, for example, smartphones and tablets, so we needed to be able to publish to different locations. And expectations of what people could do online began to shift quite a lot too. Right? People expected the experience to be richer. They wanted to be able to do things like transact, they wanted personalization, and they wanted to be able to self-serve because it's convenient if you can go online and solve a problem for yourself. Now, of course, you guys as organizations want them to do that too. That's where digital transformation happens for many organizations. If you can move people to an online channel, they can help themselves, they like it, and you get great business efficiencies from it. Now, at this point, content management isn't quite the right word anymore, is it? And that's why we began to shift the language to digital experience management. You started to say, I'm building experiences to different locations and I'm doing more than just managing content at this place. We needed a range of new features to be able to accommodate that. And so the evolution of something called a DXP happened. What is a DXP? 
What does it promise to make easy? What problems does it solve? Why will my life be better if I have one? Well, essentially, we think there are five things that DXPs do to make your life easier in this new world. The first is obviously they help you build different types of experiences. It should be easy for you to build large websites and manage people working across them, and equivalently easy to build just a simple campaign website, something small that you need to be able to publish easily. You want to be able to work with things like intranets, portals. There's a whole range of different types of things that you need to be able to publish. And if you have a tool set that gives you that flexibility and agility, well, then that's exactly what a DXP is meant to facilitate. So different types of experiences. The second I already mentioned is channels. You want to be able to publish to different locations and manage what's being published so that there's some level of continuity when people operate across these channels. We know a bad experience when we see one, for example, if you happen to start doing something on your mobile device and then you think, you know what, I'm going to move across to a desktop or something like that where I've got a keyboard and a larger screen because it'll be a little bit easier. And then you arrive and you find out you can't do the same thing. The functions aren't the same on the website. Or worse still, I have to re-enter the same content. Or even worse still, the content's not the same because they're built completely separately from each other. So you feel disconnected in the way that you deal with that organisation. So the capacity to be able to manage the way you publish content and coordinate that to different channels is an important part of what a DXP does. I mentioned personalization a second ago. Personalization is obviously really important if you're trying to sell things to people. If you can personalize, it's a great way of persuading and influencing people's actions. But it's also useful in usability. If you can help surface information that's useful for the individual and save them try time trying to find the thing that they're after, that's a great use of personalization as well. The next thing a DXP does is the self-service bit. And as I said, we're a long way from content at this point. To allow people to self-serve, you need to work across different systems. So you need to integrate well, and you need to build these little applications, really, that make it possible for people to follow business logic and follow through what they're actually trying to do. You need different tool sets to do this well. So we're beyond content management at this point. And now the final element of the five is when you're building any of these things, you want to make it easy to manage them. You don't want to have to worry about the performance, the security. You want a platform to solve those problems for you. So whenever you're building something, you just don't have to think about it. You also want to know things like your compliance is looked after. I don't want to have to worry about records keeping. I don't want to have to worry about being able to audit what I actually have. If I've got the right tools there, it will make operating in this digital space a lot easier for me. Okay, so those things together add up to the idea of a promise of a DXP. So when we're talking about that today, that's what we mean. Second term, composability. Who's heard the term composability in the context of DXPs? Stick up your hand so I get an idea. A few, and they're mostly squiz people <laughs> who are putting up their hands at the moment, right? Um, you're going to hear this term more and more across the whole industry, because I genuinely think this is a trend that stands to completely disrupt the way our experience operates at the moment, so it's important. It's an important trend. It's a complicated concept. I'll do my very best to make it simple. If I don't, hopefully it'll come clearer with examples through the rest of the day, but I'll do my best. If you look up composability online, you'll get a few different answers. One common answer as to what composability means is I can take best of breed products and make them part of my digital experience platform. That's true, but it's only part of the story. I think that undersells the promise of what uh, composability can mean for each of us. So let me try to explore that, and you'll see why I think this is more than that. So composability could be defined as the ability to bring different services together to compose new offerings. Now, I know you go, what the hell is that? That seems pretty esoteric. And I'm glad you're asking, what are services? So, Because the next slide's going to help explain that. So services is another way of saying capabilities. So digital capabilities from your platform. And an example of some of the services you expect to be able to access on a DXP are things like controls for the way you publish and present information online. You also need to be able to control who can access information. So you need to be able to log into the platform itself and control who can do what just as much as controlling who can see what once you've published that information. You need ways of being able to manage content and data. You need to be able to integrate with different systems, need to be able to personalize, manage things like workflow as part of that self-service element, and find things across the platform. These are all examples of services that you expect of a DXP. It's not an exhaustive list, 
but hopefully it makes sense when I'm saying what, when I talk about a service, what are these things are, or what do each of these things mean. Now here's one other important point. Each of these services, if you can use them together well, you can do more. They don't have to be in the same piece of software. They could be separate. But if you can call upon them to build a common digital experience, that's what I mean by composing a solution. For example, we know the search bit can be taken as its own product, or it can be used as part of a broader platform. Data and content are separate. We've got Matrix as a tool for content, Data Store as a tool for being able to store data. But you can use them all together as part of the solutions that you compose. So the services can be separate, but you can build them together into one common solution. Something like a portal, for example. I need to use each of those elements to have one common solution that I build at the end. Okay, let's get to the next piece, the P in DXP. What does that mean? The platform element. They become a platform. These services aren't just separate, discrepant things. They become a platform when they're easy to use together. They feel the same. So if something like logging in and permissions works exactly the same across each of the different services, it feels like one product, it feels like one platform. If clipping them together and building something uses the same conventions and the same ways of working, it feels like one product. They don't have to be sold as one product, you can take just the bits that you want when you want them to be able to build something. Also, once you're using them as a platform, there should be ways of being able to reuse what you've built. So if I've built, for example, a connection to another system, maybe I'm talking to my CRM system, Salesforce or something like that, can I take one that someone has already made and use it again? Because that's going to save me a lot of time. Or what if I built something bigger, a template for building websites faster, or maybe making portals quickly, or something along those lines? If I can make solutions that people, if I can take solutions that people have already built, including yourselves, and use them again across these different services, you become a platform. Then finally, there are certain things that the platform manages for you to take worry away. Things like, how do I upgrade everything? If I start choosing different services and putting them together, I take on the burden of thinking, how am I going to manage all of this? If you are taking services that have been built with the platform in mind, then some of those issues are solved for you. I don't have to worry about upgradability, visibility on how those things are performing, and by visibility I mean things like logs, audit trails, monitoring, um, uh, those sorts of different functions. Right? Okay, so I've just described core services in a digital experience um, functionality and then platform. But the third bit that I was um, defining was, plat uh, sorry, was composability. So what do we mean by composability? Two things. The first is the ability to add new services and make those services feel as if they're part of the same platform. What's a new service? Maybe I want to add events management or a new payment gateway or a translation engine. There's all sorts of amazing tools now that are getting better at AI translation of things into different languages or transcribing videos to text. There's a whole range of different tools and services that you might want to be able to grab and make them part of your DXP, make it feel like you can use them in what you build. So that's one part of composability. But if you do it properly, and this is where we actually think there's a lot of room for disruption, you should also be able to, to substitute some of those core services or add new ones. Okay, what on earth do I mean by that? Take content, for example. Increasingly, content doesn't just live in one system within our organizations. Many organizations have multiple CMSs in their environment. Is there a way that you can treat all of those CMSs as one platform. Well, that's the promise of composability. If you can treat the content from those different systems and then apply these rules around it, publish experiences that work across those solutions and republish back into those other platforms. If you can do things like speak to different channels, manage personalization, build self-service facilities, and then look after the whole thing, govern the whole thing as if it's one platform, then you have a truly composable DXP. And that's, that's the opportunity at the moment and what's really excited about, exciting for us and what's driving us at the moment. Now, I know I'm speaking at a theory level that's up at this point, and the rest of today is at a practical level. We're going to show you what we're doing and showing you examples of where we're delivering this for our customers and what we plan to deliver in the very near future. So to take over for me, I'd like to introduce Gavin, who prefers to be known as Gav, Dumsday. Gav is our Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer, which means, yes, he runs absolutely everything and is doing a great job at it. Thanks, Gav. Over to you. Thanks, JP.
JP's like a legend, he's a legend in this industry. Like he really is, I don't use that word lightly. He's been charging with this thought leadership for 24 years. He's still really fired up, like it's amazing. He said to me the other day, this is the most excited I've been since open source, like now, this moment. We've got to take people on the journey. That was pretty heavy, right? Like, a lot in there. No one is expected to remember all this today. This is the start of, a, of an ongoing conversation. But there's a lot, lot in it. This is not heavy. This is a ball pit, right? By the way, that's not a real child. That's an artificially generated child. It's an AI child. This is a ball pit. It's supposed to be fun, right? Who's been in a ball pit? Bet you I get more hands. I got more hands than you, JP. <laughs> right? I got a tip for you. Like, don't take a run up and jump into the middle of the ball pit. Don't do that. You'll jump in, you'll hit the middle, and you'll think, my God, I've got to get out. How do I get out of here? And you start struggling right towards the side. You start pushing towards the edges. And all of a sudden, you start sinking. And you feel like you're just going to give up. This is the end. Like, I'm going to die here in this ball pit. Like, you have that kind of feeling. I think tech can feel like that. Not just this space, but tech generally. Talked to a couple of customers before we started today. Like, it can feel really overwhelming. You know, you just look at everything and you think, my God, how am I going to get through this? All these applications. I feel like I'm drowning. You know, who's had that feeling? Either now, recently, or in the past, right? Like, it's a, you know, you're just like, what is this? And it can feel unattainable for many people. You know, you can be like this guy. You're on top of this tech stack, got all these applications. You don't know how to get to the other side. And so that thing that JP introduced us to, this sort of, we call it the promise of a DXP. You know, all these things that you should be able to do with our technology, with the technology of a DXP. Feels like it's out of reach. You're not going to get there. OK, but you've got to do something. You're not going to sit in the bottom of the ball pit and feel sorry for yourself, right? You've got to get out. You've got to get over the mountain. What are your options? What can you do? Okay, you can go niche, right? Go only niche, okay? First option. So the way I think about this is you see a problem, you get a bit of software to solve the problem. You see another problem you get another bit of software. But the software doesn't talk to, its, to each other, right? It's not working together as one thing. Good example, I think, in our space, maybe familiar to some of you, is you might, you might, get a, you might think, I need a portal. OK, so you go to a supplier who's got a specialized, all they do is portals, right? They're experts in portals. So they, you buy it, deploy it super quick, it looks really cool. Solves that problem. You've got a portal working now. Great, that's like a one solution thing. Six months time, you realize that you've created really inconsistent experiences for your users or for your customers. Right? They're getting a different feel right across your digital landscape. All of a sudden, you've solved one problem, got a portal, you've created heaps of others. Right? So you end up, I kind of think of it as like, you end up with, take a step back, you look at all this thing you've created and it's like Frankenstein's monster, right? Oh my God, what have I done? So that's not going to work. So the go only niche, and I mean only niche, go only niche, not a good answer, we don't think. Okay, so you can go big. What's go big? Go big is get a big tech firm, you know, go all in with them, give them the lot. Right, this is all too hard. You know that mountain of tech, that ma those applications? Go give it to them all. Give all of it to the, the big tech supplier. Take the lot. But they'll want to take the lot. Right? They'll want to swap everything. And for some people, if you're a billions and billions of size organisation, you've got the time, you've got the money. You can wait years for that. You can spend millions and millions of dollars for that. You're really getting a return on investment? We're not sure. And the speed can be so slow. You know, you all know people, I know people, I shouldn't tell the examples, but there are people who have, they kind of lost their careers doing that, you know? They deploy new tech stack, takes 18 months, takes forever, 
get to the end of it, fail, didn't work. So you've brought all that risk in. You know, you brought the risk of your digital experiences, your user experiences in, and you didn't get there in the end. That, so that can work, can also be really risky. So we think you should come as you are. We think that you should BYO tech stack. So what does that mean? We think we shouldn't force you to re-platform, right? We think you shouldn't be blocked out from using new things. You shouldn't be blocked out just because, say, for example, you're not on SaaS. You should get access to the new things that are being built. You shouldn't be forced into corners. Okay, we think that's really important. We think that you should be able to deploy really quickly, but we think beyond that, you're going to keep evolving, right? You're going to keep evolving over time. Your skills are going to evolve. Your tech stack's going to evolve. Your needs are going to evolve. You need someone to do that with you so that you can keep coming as you are. It's not just at the beginning. People do this stuff over years and years. Like, you, you keep evolving. So we're really passionate about this. Like, it drives at the very core of everything that we do. Okay, so... That point of come as you are, it like it, honestly, it sounds like a slogan, and we might use it like that in full disclosure, but it actually captures, it means something, okay? It captures the essence of what this organisation is doing. So where's Greg Sherwood? Where are you, mate? Greg Sherwood, up the back. He built Matrix 20 years ago, by the way. He's now the head of, he's now the, the head of product engineering in our company, not in marketing, he doesn't use this phrase, come, he doesn't use come as you are. I'm not going to pretend they do. But i tell you what they do do. They go, you know what, we're not, they'll have internal debates, product and engineering, about what they're building for you to use. And they have the debate and they go, we're not going to build like that because that doesn't let a dev come as they are. We're not going to build like that because editors and comms people can't build, can't build content in the format that they want in using the tools that they want. They can't do it. So they have that debate and it's real. And if you want to see a passionate debate, come to a squiz quarterly planning session with the product and engineering crew and watch them fight because they're fighting for you. That's the point, nicely. They're fighting for you to come as you are. So you see, they don't say it, but it does, it does bring everything together that they think about. Okay, so come as you are. With this DXP, you already have it. I've talked to a few before. You don't, most people don't realise you've got access to it already. If you're using any parts of our services today, you have access to the DXP. As we add more services, you also have access. How does that access work? Today, you contact an account manager, a customer success person, and they'll enable you. Early next year, Julie Brittle, our CPO. Where are you, Julie? She might be talking about this. Early next year, it'll be automatic. So what we, not automatic, like don't, like IT managers here, don't stress, we're not giving it to everybody. Don't freak out. But it'll have governance and controls and access. So you'll be able to control who gets access to it so that they can what? So come as they are, come as you are. Bring your tech stack. You, you've already got our tech stack. It's already there. So you can try what you like. These, again, are principles. They're not taglines. These are principles that, that drive things. So Julie, the product team, and the engineers are creating the product in a way that you can trial it. That's the principle. So you can get access to it. You can choose what you need after that. And you can pay for what you use. Just a stupid aside, yesterday I practiced this, and I said, pay what you want. Like, you can't pay what you want. OK? <laughs> Just a, you can't pay what you want. Okay, but the pay for what you use, again, not a slogan. It govern, we've got a pricing team that governs how they create the pricing, right? So these things, these thoughts drive through everything we do. We're very principle-led. So you come as you are. With the world's most composable DXP. Okay, that's a, that's a big claim, right? We're well on the way to this. I don't say we're there, okay? We're, but we're well on the way. So it is composable in the way that JP said. So JP, you said a lot. 
a lot of the passion in JP, a lot of the things that he's really driven about is this thought of composability. So you, you are on a platform and you do get the benefit of all of the platform tools. We have that bit. I'll come to the worlds. Okay, so the worlds bit is... How do I explain this simply? Composability is more than this piece of software talks to that piece of software. That's just integration. That is not composability. Okay? True composability is you can swap services in and out and manage them as if they're the same product. That sentence means a lot. You can swap services in and out and manage them as if they're the same product. We could spend two days talking about that. That is a very big difference to just doing integration. Frankly, anyone can do integration. Lots of people will say, yeah, 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 all the tech stack talks together. It's just integrating. It's not truly composable. This thought drives everything that we do. You can't, here's the thing. Tracy, this is a bit that I am like, I'm really fired up about this. You can't just wake up one day and go, we're composable, ta-da, we're composable now, when you're a software supplier like us. You can't do that, right? You can't be a really big tech firm and grab, uh, like buy a lot of smaller firms. You can't grab them, buy them all, sticky tape them all together, slap a logo on the front and go, we're composable now. It, doesn't, it just doesn't work like that, right? You have to architect. So Greg, Jason Fisher, put your hand up. Jason's our CTO. Their team's Julie Brettel, huge team. You have to build like this for years to be truly composable. It doesn't just happen like that. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And I get passionate about it because I worry that we're not, the industry has not understood it. You don't really get this truly composable experience at the end just because an organisation says so. We are not all the way to where we want to be. We are well down the road. We are well down the road to the world's most composable DXP. That's what we're building. Okay, so that's the composable bit. That's that story. I'm clearly very passionate about that. You've got to also fulfill the promise. So there's the, okay, great, it's composable. And as we say, like, what's composable, right? Like, I don't want to have a whole bunch of services that aren't very good composable. So what? They've got to be great. They've got to fulfill this promise of a DXP. So we will talk to you a lot about this through the rest of today, but beyond today. So what is the promise of a DXP? So JP described the five things. We fulfill many parts of those five things today and a lot more very soon. And by very soon, I mean Julie's going to make some announcements. Julie, the, the outside of them is September. Is the September is the furthest out date we're going to talk about. And nothing we're talking about isn't already being built because we don't want to do presentations in PowerPoint about theoretical things that we're thinking about one day. We want you to know what's available now and very soon. Okay, so personalization. Personalization is, um, is available for us now. You can do a lot in Matrix, but you have to be a dev. Very soon, uh, if you're a marketer or a, uh, or a content creator uh, or a comms person, you'll be able to do personalization easily yourself without the dev. Okay, easily yourself without the dev. So what sort of stuff would you be able to do? A simple example is you can, I don't know, look for a student who um, uh, has a low GPA and they haven't logged into your portal for, say, a week or something. So you see I said and, like these complex business rules that you can employ. These are ands. You can get the data and say, okay, so who is that person who hasn't, who's got a low GPA, hasn't logged in for a while? Because we, we want to do something differently with them. Right? So we grab that piece of data. You can just produce the data and hand it over to your student success people if you're a college or a university. And they can analyze it and use it, but they can also use it to create different experiences for those people. But the powerful thing here is it's not just what you can do. The point here is that marketers, comms people, you can do it. You don't need an editor. Oh, sorry, you don't need a dev. 
Okay, and that's really, like, it's a very big change. Okay, so we can do a lot today in channels. Uh, I think Nat Simler, our Chief Services Officer, hands up Nat. Uh, Nat's going to talk a bit about how Connect and Data Store work, so I won't steal your thunder. Um, but they are products that came out at Squiz a few years ago. A lot of customers are using them. They do a lot of different things, so I won't explain them all. One of the things they do is that they bring data in from your ecosystem. So a bunch of different sources bring data in, they turn it into the right format so you can push it out into multi-channel experiences. Really, really cool. Again, though, probably got to be a dev. We need to unlock that. We are unlocking that. There's a whole bunch of work going into the Squiz marketplace so that you can use it, and we're getting better and better at making that available for people so that non-technical people can use it. Um, you can use, you can integrate with more channels like, like Slack, for example, or Microsoft Dynamics, you can get data out of and push that. Where's Carrie Ham, my friend? Could be the smartest person I've ever met, Carrie. Carrie Hand up the back. So say hi, everyone. So Carrie, I think you've got like a, a chat booth or something like out the front on breaks. So if you're keen to go, okay, I want to do more integrations or I, I want to nag Carrie because I've got something that I want to have a pre-built integration for later, go nag Carrie on a break. Um, you can find out a lot more about that. So channel's doing a lot. Okay, so self-service. So self-service, we can do a heap of self-service enabling things today. Really cool. Uh, one of the things that we're getting better at, we're going to get a lot better at next year, which is your September announcement, I think, Julie, is advanced forms. Okay, so that you can do logic, uh, like, like conditional logic, like, so conditional logic is the next question that you get presented, like in a form, is dependent on the, question, the way you answer the previous question. Okay, that's, that's conditional logic. So um, you want to be able to do that and do that easily. You also want to be able to sometimes include payment options, right? So you, you want to be able to do that, and you want to be able to do that if you're not a dev. So the way that we're creating forms, advanced forms, early, uh, mid next year, is to be done in a way that non-technical people can do it, and do it super quick. Julie says minutes, like I don't want to promise, is it really minutes? Julie says minutes for doing that so sort of thing, which I think is absolutely amazing, right? That's what we're building. Why? So that you can get more self-service, right? Many of you are trying to get more self-service for your, it's not self-service for you, it's self-service for your users, your customers, okay? so that you're trying to get more, more automation, more self-service. So that's really cool. Governance, second last of the five. So governance, um, we do a lot today on governance. Um, like ISO, um, we've invested a lot in data centers, SAS, SAS with AWS and all of the tools that AWS bring, and there's a session later with Jason and the AWS crew. Uh, you can find out more about that. Uh, bug bounty, really cool. Nag Jason on a break. What's bug bounty? We're doing that. Uh, but we're doing a lot. Um, performance, uh, one of the really cool things in performance is it, it, even if you're not using our tech stack, any tech stack, not even in this space, the more you use, the more you consume, if nothing else changes, it can slow down. It can. These guys, these brilliant people are making it such that while you can even get more and more from us that we're building over the next couple of years, they're, making it, they're architecting it in a way that's actually getting faster, faster and faster. Nag Jason again. How are we getting faster? So by that I mean the system that you're using with us is getting faster and faster. So Jason or Greg or any of that crew, they can help you understand that better. Okay. I've saved, I think this is the best to last, but I don't know. Maybe the personalization, the marketers. Julie and I have been having this debate. We, uh, it's time to unlock the devs, right? Unleash the devs. They laugh at me when I say that, but I mean, <laughs> like, unleash the devs. So the devs today can be shackled. You can be trapped into matrix, right? You need matrix skills. It takes you quite a while to learn them. We don't want that for you. We want you to be able to cut time for devs to come as you are. Bring your skills. So bring JavaScript, bring React frameworks. Build the way you want. Build locally. Build independently. Use your environment, 
right? Test and put it back in yourself. Move super fast. Build brilliantly clever solutions. This is an absolute game changer for devs. Devs at Squiz, devs in your organisation. We've got a session on this later. I think this is absolutely amazing what the guys have done. This is not like some pie in the sky thing. They've built it. It's just in final stages of testing. They're going to demo it today. So Greg Sherwood, Chris Grist, they're representing an amazing group. They are amazing. And they're representing an amazing group of people who have built this. It's like a great moment for all of the dev community. If you're a manager of devs, what's that mean for you? It can be hard to upskill someone to train them in this environment today. That's gone. You can hire people with generic skills in the industry, get them up and running super quick, build amazing solutions. This is really, truly amazing. OK, last slide. Um, we're not chucking you back in the ball pit. So, you know, we could just give you access to all of the systems, right? We could do that. You could jump in, but you'd be back in the middle, right? We've got great people. This is a key difference between us and many other people. These people are amazing. A lot of them are in services, in the, in the wonderful team led by Nat Semler. We can bring developers, solution architects, people with industry expertise, uh, UX and designers, uh, people who are migration experts, and of course, customer success who can train you in how to use the products, how to get the most out of it. You don't need to talk to all of them. What is a digital deep dive? OK, so what we're covering today, what I've covered, what's about to be covered, is very generic. Like, I acknowledge that. It's a, it's a taste test for you to get your head around the concepts that we're talking about. Um, that needs to be individualised for you. So we, in these deep dives, we can get the product, talk to you about what we're doing with the product, but in a way that suits your tech stack so that you can get your head around it better. But we need to hear from you as well in that digital deep dive. So in that moment, what are you trying to achieve? What are your problems? You know, I heard quite a few this morning from the customers that I was talking to before we started. Like, so we hear from you. Then we bring these industry experts or bring the relevant people, give you advice. And then we think we created a plan at the end of that. Now, quite frankly, you might have a digital deep dive that's an hour, and your digital deep dive might be, mate, can you get my tickets done quicker? All right, that might be it. Ed's already doing that, going to keep doing it. Actually, did you promise that you're getting back up on stage next year and the graphs are going to keep getting better? Did you promise? You did. You did. You, you are doing that. All those graphs are going to keep getting better next year. So don't, like, just so my view, just forget it. Don't have a digital deep dive for that. You might say, uh, I need to plan our upgrade. We can do that through that process as well. But really, you might go, OK, I, I understand that we need to be doing personalization. I hear that organizations like us are doing it somewhere else in the world. We're not. I don't know how to get started. Where do we start? Digital deep dive will help you. Or you might want to do more self-service. Or you might want to create even better experiences. All of that can be done there. We've done deep dives that last a week, like five days, really full on. We've done deep dives that are two, three hours. So how do you get a deep dive? Where are all the account managers here? Should all know your account managers? Nag them. Get a deep dive. Like, it's the way to just, everything you're hearing today Everything you're hearing today is a lot to take in. Get into one of these deep dives and you can go to the next level and you can decide how little or how much of all of this that you want to take in. You take in as much as you want because you come as you are. So that's it for me. I'm going to, hang in a second, hang it over to the, to the amazing Nat Simler, Chief Services Officer. So Nat is going to talk about how all of this is happening in action today. She's then going to hand over to Julie, who's making announcements. But I think you might explain front end as a service a bit conceptually. And other than that, everything else is what we've got engineers with hands on keyboards building. So, really good. A lot more depth in the next two sessions. If you want more depth than, than that, Chris, uh, we've got Chris Grist, Greg Sherwood sessions. We've got Jason Fish and ses sessions to come. So, it's great. Thanks for your time. Hope you all have a great day.
You should call me a legend too. You should also call me a legend. Thanks, no. legend. <laughs> I'm just terrified about the idea of unleashing the devs. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nat Semler, and as legend just uh, mentioned, I am the Chief Services Officer for Squiz. Um, so you would have heard uh, both JP and Gav talk already about the promise of a DXP. Well, I am not here to promise you anything today. I'm actually just going to show you cold, hard facts. Um, we're going to recap um, on some of our uh, products that we have at Squiz. We're going to have a look at uh, a few of our recent developments in uh, templates and design systems. Uh, we're going to look at about 10 different customer examples of what you're already doing with your DXP. And I've got two very exciting announcements where I get to pretend to be a product manager for a few minutes. So the, all of this is uh, examples of what you can already do today with your DXP. And everybody in this room already has one at your fingertips. So no promises, just facts. On. I have just gone the wrong way. So, a quick product recap. So, all of you would be familiar with Matrix and Funnelback, our content management system uh, and our search tool. They've been the backbone of our business for many years, so, and I think everyone in here would be using at least one of those. What you're probably not all using is the next three products. So, we have Connect for integration, Data Store for data aggregation and Marketplace, which is a home of reusable things. And I'll just explain those a little bit further. So who in the room knows what an iPaaS is? Yep, fair few. Uh, integration platform as a service. Basically, it's, uh, it's SaaS software that enables you to push and pull third-party uh, data between different systems. Uh, Connect is Squiz's iPaaS. So it has a graphical user interface, which means you don't have to be a hardcore techie to use it. You still need a bit of familiarity with um, integration concepts. Um, and it also comes with pre-built recipes to speed up builds. So this is basically pre-built configuration um, for a lot of software that you'd already be familiar with. Things like Salesforce um, integrations are already pre-built into it. Plus, you can also customize, um, for example, your own internal um, third party. You can integrate with internal third party systems that you may have built yourself as long as they're API enabled. So that's Connect. Uh, data Store uh, is basically a way for devs to aggregate data into a single place, and then from there they can manipulate it into the shape that they need to do things like uh, apply permissions at group or individual level to do things like personalization and, and self serve. It is a dev tool. Um, but it does come uh, with a whole bunch of pre-built configurations, which is called blueprints. So that helps to speed up your development time. And Marketplace, the home of reusable things. So things like those Connect recipes that I just mentioned, the blueprints, and the templates that I'm just about to show you, uh, we publish them all into our Marketplace so that you can make use of them. So three products. So armed with that knowledge, let's go back and have a look at our DXP capabilities map. So as JP mentioned earlier, uh, implied within um, the capability of building digital experiences is the ability to be able to do that quickly and easily and with high quality. And we're going to have a look at how we've used templates to, to do that recently. So earlier generations of our templates, uh, who here would have been familiar with Neo as a template? That have you? Yeah, there's quite a lot of hands. Okay, so a couple of years ago, we invented a template called Neo, um, and we used that as a way of quickly publishing websites. It was pretty good for speed to market, um, but where it did fall over a bit was if we had to customize on top, it was a lot of work. Sometimes if we had to customize a lot, it was just as much work to do the customizing as maybe what it would have been to build it from the ground up. So that was a bit of a problem, um, and the way that we addressed that was we built a new generation of templates, which I'll show you in a minute, and the problem that we sought to solve was to make them flexible so that you could both get speed and flexibility from that deployment. Julie's going to talk a little bit in a little bit about the future generation of template technology and what's just around the corner, so I'm not going to steal Julie's surprise there. But let's have a look at today's generation of templates. So this is skeleton, what you're looking at here. So if you think of any website, they have a lot of... Um, commonly used components, so headers, footers, breadcrumbs, accordions, they're all examples of things that you know, we could build over and over again, but that would be a waste of time and money. Um, 
And it also chews into the time and effort that you could be spend doing um, really valuable things like personalization. So we wanted to be able to um, build those things once, but then reuse them many times, um, but also be able to customize them. And so the idea of a skeleton component is it's a piece of functionality. So for an example, is an, an accordion. Um, and we can deploy that either, either as a single component into a, a website, or we can group it all together and deploy it um, as a whole website, as per what's on the screen here with Skeleton. Now that is design free. So think of it like a whole bunch of functioning wireframes. And those wireframes inherit the design attributes of the site that you injected into. So you can build bespoke designs and slide them in underneath all of these components, and then they will display uh, using your design. But we know that sometimes um, you need to just do things in a hurry, um, and you can't wait to do a custom design, uh, or you want to give something a slightly different look to, uh, say, your big corporate site. And so we have built Raptor. And Raptor is just skeleton, what you just saw before, but with a pre-existing design built into it. So that just gets us to speed. You can still change things like colors and a little bit of layout, but if you want to go really, really custom, then Skeleton's probably going to be your best friend. Both of these templates are backwards compatible to Matrix 5 and Funnelback 15, um, or you can use them on the latest stack, which means that you can come as you are, because that's part of our core philosophy, um, and make use of it today with your existing stack. Here are a couple of real life examples. So um, how, how many council people have we got in the room? Yeah, quite a few. Um, so you would know um, just how broad the range of topics are that councils have to cover. So you've got everything from uh, cemeteries to libraries, building applications, there's a lot. Uh, and so it, it, one problem is that you could just build a massive corporate website with heaps of data in it and people couldn't just get lost in that website. But often, what's a better approach is to group that sub those subjects together and make microsites out of them. And that way, you can deliver targeted information with its own slight, different, slight twist on your branding, so that you um, so that you can just publish these nice little microsites and, and then direct your your um, your users to the right website. So both of these sites um, are about environmental management. One is by Waverley Council here in Sydney, uh, and the other is by Horizons Council in New Zealand. Uh, both of these sites took five weeks to build. Now, websites like this a couple of years ago probably would have taken about 12 weeks. Why? Well, we probably would have done UX. We definitely would have had to do design. We would have had to do design cut up. We would have had to build all the components and QA test them, load content, all of those things. We have built good design principles and UX principles already into these templates. Raptor has recently been BPAT certified for accessibility as well, so you can deploy it knowing um, that you're looking after your accessibility principles. So, five, uh, so 12 weeks down to five weeks. It's probably not obvious as well, but when you get up to that part where you do QA testing, because we've already QA tested the componentry before we even made it a template, you have a lot less problems right from the get-go. So these are big time savers. In these cases, they were probably about half the time of what it normally would have taken us to build a website. Our personal best is two days to deploy a website from the moment we first knew about it to getting it live. Um, and probably one of those two days was actually pulling componentry out and um, because it was a very low amount of data. So there's a lot of variability here because you know it depends on how much you customize uh, as to how long it takes. But uh, yeah, that, that website that took two days, um, we've done a similar thing in the past for the same client and it probably would have taken us about 10 days. So 10 days down to two days, five times faster. I'm calling that a success. Now, both Skeleton and Raptor are examples of Squiz's own design system. So what do I mean by design systems? Well, many of you guys are already building them, um, just as we have built one as well. It's a central, uh, centrally managed library of reusable functionality. Um, it's built uh, to empower your editors and your digital content creators to be able to be self-sufficient but also maintain control of your brand. So it's especially relevant for larger organizations. So you've got your central brand, you've got a whole bunch of distributed editors and devs, and you're a bit worried that they're gonna go maybe feral with your brand, because you unleash the devs. Where's Legend? Thanks, Legend. Um, 
So um, you, want to, you want these people to be enabled so that they can do things, but you also want to protect your brand so that they're doing things with guardrails. Um, this is a, a governance story, and we all know governance can be kind of arduous, um, but this turns governance into being something that's like an administrative burden to something that actually just empowers your end users. So, um, yeah, that's design systems. Um, we've got uh, several of our uh, government uh, customers who are doing it and quite a lot of universities who are doing it now as well. Um, and you can see some examples there on the board. So that's, uh, that's templates and design systems. Um, and just to recap, they make it faster. Up to five times is our PB. That's pretty cool. Um, they bake in good quality, yep. And the other thing that I didn't mention is that they are also an inspiration library for your end users or your editors or your developers. Um, basically, anyone who's looking to publish something um, or design a user experience um, can look to your, um, your design system or your, market, your marketplace equivalent um, and gather up ideas. Now, this is a point where I get to put on my uh, pretend product manager hat because I do actually have something, speaking of inspiration libraries, which I hope that our, uh, our university uh, customers here will get excited about. Um, I really love this example because it's something that we've put a lot of years of experience into. So all of the work that we've done with our education sector over the years, um, we've brought that together. We've brought together all the cool things that we can do with our DXP and really just um, made something that's like geeky UX heaven. So um, with a bit of a drum roll, I'd like to introduce you to our latest templated solution, uh, Edify. So Edify is a student portal template. So we call it uh, an experience accelerator because it's not a hard-coded product where you just get what you get and you can't customise it. We know that our universities are all different, but in a lot of cases you have some similar needs. So we've tried to pull together the similarities but still leave you with enough flexibility that you can customise to be individual. So it uses the same skeleton framework that I was referring to to give you the ability to apply your own design. Uh, it works on desktop and mobile, and it's also a progressive web app, PWA, which means that you can uh, do things like make it available offline. It integrates with multiple back-end systems, and I'll show you those in a minute. And because of those integrations, we can personalise things like calendars, exam timetables, um, uh, course info, credits. There's a lot of personalisation on this page. Um, it's also got matrix behind the scenes, so you can um, so you can still publish pages, build up an IA, um, you can um, centralise your communications here or bring it in from third-party systems. Um, and it basically is just giving you a personalised, unified student experience. Now, this is pretty cool because portals are really hard to build. Normally, portal projects take months and months. And we've pulled it together into just a, a single out-of-the-box experience that is powered by our DXP. And this is how it works. So architecture diagrams, fun. Over on the left, you've got matrix and funnel back, uh, which is serving up the content, um, personalised content to your students. Um, over on the, sorry, that's the right. Your left, my right. Um, over on my left, you also have uh, Connect, which was a product we talked about earlier, which is pushing and pulling third party systems um, from things like LMSs, um, student uh, management systems, customer relationship management systems, um, and they're using pre-built Connect recipes um, to all of those branded ones that, I'm, that we've got on the screen there. And as I mentioned earlier, you can build custom um, Connect flows for any custom back-end systems you have as well. We're using Data Store to pull that information together and aggregate it and then manipulate it into the shape that's needed to be able to provide, um, to personalise um, the content, so that's basically through permissions management at individual or group level, um, and it helps to render the page a lot faster because we get it into the shape it needs to be um, so that we can then um, push it through to the front end. So this is in Squiz Marketplace right now, and if you're interested, you can go in there and you can demo the whole thing, um, and then beyond that, if you'd like to find out more, you can have a talk to your account managers and they will um, show you the rest. So that is Edify, our templated student portal. So Edify is a really good example of the whole DXP in action. So it does personalization, 
It's got automation, it's got governance baked into it, uh, it does self-service, cross-channel, it's all going on with that one solution. Um, but that's only a, a thing that's quiz built, it's not actually a real life example, so let's have a look at a real life example. This example has almost exactly the same architecture as Edify, and it's for our US customer, Computer Aid Inc. So Computer Aid uh, is a tech services company in the US, um, and currently they have about two and a half thousand users and growing uh, using this personalized intranet. It also has uh, data store uh, and connect at the back end, uh, it uses multi-factor authentication using uh, Azure and Okta, um, and it integrates with a tool called uh, Workplace. Now Workplace um, has a whole bunch of user attributes stored in it, uh, and we use those attributes to personalize content such as calendars, um, just articles, news events, things like that. Um, the welcome messages also change according to the time of day um, and the season. Um, and it also has things like uh, anniversaries and birthdays, like work anniversaries and birthdays and those sorts of things in it. So there's a lot of personalization going on here. Another portal um, is the Department of South Australia. Now this is our student pathways project. So I have a, a, a year 12 student who's just finishing her exam, her last exams tomorrow. And so I've kind of been living this world of trying to prep her for the workforce. I'm, it's kind of, kind of hard getting a 17 year old kid interested and in trying to think like, you know, what does it take to hold down a job, that kind of stuff. So this is about taking a government policy um, to help prepare our kids for the workforce uh, and, and really just turn it into a tangible solution that helps them to be ready for that. Um, so students can uh, authenticate into this portal and from here, among other things, they can um, progressively build up their CV um, and they can export it. Um, they can look at uh, jobs that employees are, uh, employees are posting, um, they can uh, take up work experience challenges and log how they're progressing through that. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of things going on in the portal. Um, this is, we did a lot of UX work to, do, to drive this as well. So Peter Krieg in the room there, um, his amazing team went out and did a lot of uh, user interviews with students, um, wireframing all the way through to prototyping um, and, and testing those with students. And so this portal is really intuitive um, for students to get in there and start figuring out how to interact um, with their future workplaces. So that's Department of Education SA. That also has React apps in the background and it makes use of data store to help pull information together and manage it and personalize it. Okay, Adelaide Metro. If I had to pick a favorite child, it would be Adelaide Metro. Um, who here uses public transport? Pretty much everyone. Keep your hand up if you um, come from SA or Adelaide. Not very many. Peter, just, oh, two, <laughs> excellent. Um, so you guys have probably used this, and those of you not from SA would have used something very similar. This is the thing that you use when you're going home from work and you wanna know when the next train or tram is coming, that kind of thing. In Queensland, it's TransLink. Um, New South Wales Transport, would that be the New South Wales equivalent? Anyway, um, it's basically um, just, you know, it's simple. Like on the front end, it is simple. You wanna go, where am I now? Where am I going to get to? That seems pretty straightforward. But if you think about a public transport network, behind the scenes, there is so much going on. There's multiple timetables, there's service outages, um, there's mapping systems, geolocations. There's a lot going on behind the scenes there. Um, and because we have an amazing UX team, an amazing tech team, we had a great customer and a really good tech stack, we were able to take all of that complexity and leave that in the back end and just build a really beautiful, easy to use front end service for the public. Uh, it integrates with a lot of things. It includes AWS, Google, uh, we've got multiple mapping systems, geolocation, there's, a, there's an awful lot going on in the back. Um, and yeah, the tech behind it has just made it so much easier to manage from an end to end perspective. So that's Adelaide Metro. Another one is Sienna. So this is another public website that shows that the force is strong with our DXP. Um, and uh, so Sienna is a multinational uh, telecommunications giant. It's based in the US. It's really big. So think about it like the world's biggest player in optical connectivity. So fiber optics distribution and networks laying, all those sorts of things. That's what Sienna does. Uh, they have a lot of websites with us, but I just want to zoom in on the multilingual functionality because the way we've, uh, we've built that I think is pretty cool. 
So Sienna has about 20 different websites in Matrix and they've got a, a centralized structure of content snippets in there. Um, and when editors publish content, that gets uh, pushed from Matrix into Connect and then from Connect, it gets pushed across to a third party system, called a translation engine called WordBee, where it gets translated by real people. Once it's done, it comes back through Connect into Matrix and then from there it gets pushed out to the relevant multilingual website um, and we've just automated the entire translation process from end to end. Now, normally that takes, you're either using something like Google Translate, which you know sometimes is more like auto-confuse than auto-translate. Um, and it also has a, a, like a, 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 an interface in the middle there, which allows you to see where each part of the translation service is up to. So as it's going through that journey, you can see the status of it. So this is great. It basically just means that you can automate that whole process end to end. You know you're getting good content. It's going out live. It's been QA tested. The whole thing is, is just working from end to end. And if you think about governance processes that would normally go into that, it would be a pain in the neck. Um, and this is just automated now. So I think that's just a really good example um, of using a composed architecture to get something done. It's quite reusable as well. Okay, so governance. I've got another big announcement. So second time I'm putting on my product manager hat and this is gonna make governance seem pretty cool. I know it's hard to believe. Um, but I would like to introduce you to our, uh, our latest uh, composed solution, which is our web archive, or WARC as we know it. All right, so those of you who remember rollback or might still be using rollback, this is about a thousand times better. Um, for starters, it's a composed solution. So that means you can put it across the top of any website. It doesn't have to be matrix. Um, and it can take snapshots um, and store them for you. So when you, you know, you're worried about if you have to go to court one day and prove what was on your website on the 7th of March or something like that, this is how you do it. Uh, but you can do it with any website. It includes third party content. So if you're drawing in information from a third party and it's published on your website, some of the old ways of doing that, you wouldn't get the third party content. Now you do. Um, because it's a composed solution, it sits on the outside of the CMS, which means that over time it doesn't build up and clag up your CMS and affect performance. Uh, it saves that information elsewhere so that, um, so that it's isolated and it's all fully managed by Squiz. So you don't have to um, you know, work with third party um, snapshot providers or anything like that. It's just all in one, under one roof. Here's how it works. So you have matrix. Um, upon either scheduled events or triggers, uh, such as uh, a page being published or something like that, um, that gets pushed through to Connect. And we have a premium web, web archive service that sits around Connect that takes those snapshots for you. Those snapshots then get pushed off into uh, eight, uh, Amazon S3 buckets. Um, and we also create a log, just in the Google spreadsheet. You have access to that log. So if you then want to go back and see what was published on that particular point in time, oops, hang on, I've gone too far forward. Um, oh, you click on the, um, you click on the, the, you go into your spreadsheet with the logs, you find the date, you click on the link, and it restores your website to look something like this. So I just want to give a shout out to Queensland Health because they've been helping us beta test this for the last few months. Um, it's working. <laughs> Uh, and this is ready for action at the end of this month. So you'll be able to make use of this uh, if you'd like it uh, at the end of this, this month. Uh, and your account managers will be able to give you more detail about that if you would like to talk to them or me. Okay, so that's about my 20 minutes. Um, just do a bit of a recap. Um, today we have looked at um, a bit of a recap on our products. So we've looked at Connect, Data Store and Marketplaces. Uh, we have looked at templates and design systems. So we saw, we saw uh, Skeleton and Raptor and what some of the design systems that you guys are using. We looked at about 10 different customer examples and we announced two things. Now, I feel like I should have a partridge in a pear tree, but I don't think it's quite that close to Christmas. But anyway, um, we got there. I could bang on all day about this stuff because uh, you know, working with you guys actually really does just give us the opportunity to build so many great solutions. Uh, and I know that you know, um, my team gets really excited doing it for you and we really enjoy working with you. So um, thank you for the opportunity to build such amazing solutions. Um, 
Obviously, we're gonna keep getting better though. Our product stack is evolving and um, here to help uh, explain what's coming up around the corner is the amazingly talented Julie Breddle. And Julie is our Chief Product Officer. So, welcome to the stage, Julie. Can I press on the green button? There we go. Hi, uh, so I'm Julie. I'm the Chief Product Officer for Squiz. And I've done a lot of customer visits over the last 12 months. Uh, and there's a few really familiar faces in the audience. Uh, but I'm really excited for the opportunity here to be able to talk to you about our product vision and our roadmap and how we are going to be working together with you all to build really great digital experiences. So our product roadmap is really focused on building market-leading products that will work really perfectly well together and really seamlessly in concert with all the other technology that will really enable you to build genuinely meaningful and digital experiences to help your customers. So as you've heard from JP and Gav earlier, we've really reimagined what a composable DXP can build and we be able to giving you the flexibility to use the MarTech stack that you choose and build really amazing things. So I have three really cool and big announcements for today. Uh, so they're really key roadmap items that we're gonna deliver over the next 12 months, but I think Gav just gave me 10 months, so 10 months. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one, announcement one. So it's really vital that developers can be hired who can build, bring their own skills and get up and running really, really quickly. And we think it's essential for those skills to be employed in really modern JavaScript frameworks, using the languages your developers want to build in. We really don't want to limit what the code base your developers can build in uh, and we'll restrict that in any way. We also know that managing design systems can be really hard. Nat was just talking about them, but for a lot of our customers, they might be sharing design systems between different departments, different schools inside a university, and managing those can be really tricky. And content editors need to be more self-sufficient. They need to be able to self-service and easily use pre-built components, pre-built by Squiz, pre-built by our partners, pre-built by their own development teams, so that they can quickly build what they need and get it in front of customers as soon as possible. So to solve all of these problems, I'd like to announce our new component service that's in internal beta testing right now and will be released in March 2023. So the component service, it's a really new way for our services teams and our customer developers to work using JavaScript and other popular frameworks to create components or design systems, which are then made available back into Matrix for content editors to use. So yes, you can build components in Matrix right now. But as Gav did say, you know, we're not gonna force you to change. You can keep building components the same way you do right now, but we genuinely don't think you're going to want to. Because regardless of your role in building digital experiences, from developer to marketer to communications expert to content editor, this new component service is gonna make your job easier, faster, cheaper, and more easily governed. So I've got a few sort of show ways that we can show how we're building this. So site builders will be able to view sets of components from the DXP console. And it'll make it a lot easier for you to manage and share design systems across multiple sites, different applications, wherever you need them to be shared. Content editors will see libraries of components in Matrix. They'll be built by Squiz, easily accessed and downloaded from the marketplace, built by their, our partners, or built by their own development team. And they'll be really easily able to add these new components from within Matrix and then configure them. We're gonna have reusable sets of fields for things like cards, accordions, carousels, and conditional fields that'll make it a lot easier to edit structured content. So these components can be displayed on a matrix page and it'll also work seamlessly with the older version of the components already available in matrix. You don't need to do a great big migration and build everything in the new component system. Uh, they'll also integrate really nicely with Funnelback, so it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to pull the search results into your page easily. But you don't need to be on matrix to use our new components. Components can be centrally managed, but easily used anywhere you need, including outside sites built on the Squiz DXP. Like this newsfeed that we literally built three days ago on a WordPress site, so this is real. Uh, so it also is gonna make it really easy to use final back results on any other CMSs as well. 
So this really reinforces that composable strategy we've been talking about all day. It's inherent in everything that we're building as a product team. We're building the world's most composable DXP, and components are one of the pieces of functionality that really underpins this vision. But we're not stopping there. So this is a really big step towards our overall front end as a strategy service, uh, front end as a service strategy. So developers, we know you want to build fast, and DXP Components introduces those first steps of the decoupled rendering and overhauling the headless capabilities available inside the Squiz DXP already. But we need to continue with the ultimate goal of really improving our headless capabilities until they're amazing. So we're not saying you have to build headless. Uh, the components will work equally well on headless or head-on solutions, but we're giving you the flexibility that we know you need. Content editors. So the work we're doing now uh, is really paving the way for us to iterate on a much better, more intuitive, and easier to use visual page builder. So this will be like an evolution of the current way, of the current editing experience. We're gonna add in a lot more capabilities that's refined and optimized. So we want that ideal content editor authoring experience. This ends the trade-offs. So at the moment, you know, you build a bunch of components, make developers' lives easier, but we're not, we can't, we don't always make content editors easier. Or we're building out new visual things, but we're not making it easier for developers. Building out this front end as a service strategy is ending that trade-off. It means we'll be able to build, uh, build things that developers need and content editors need, underpinning it all with better organizational governance. So if you'd like to learn more, including some live demos, uh, there's an afternoon session with Chris and Greg. Uh, and also, please contact your account manager or Chris. There's a booth out there around Ask a Product Expert. Uh, come and ask for demos. Come and talk to us. We'd love to talk to you about the component uh, service and if there's anyone who would like to be an early access customer. Second announcement. So your customers expect the sites they visit to be personalized to suit them. Personalization can be really difficult for organizations, though, for both even anonymous or authenticated personalization. So you have to manage all the different types of content. You have to figure out all the different customer journeys that you expect your, your customers to sort of take through your site. All the different data integrations, it can be really, really overwhelming. It's also really difficult to measure the return on investment of personalization for services-based companies. So if you can't roll out a strategy, sell 3,000% more socks and go, awesome, we did a good job, how do you measure if all of this effort that you're doing to make a personalization strategy is actually helping your customers? So to solve all these problems and more, we are releasing the Squiz customer data platform. So it's in beta early next year and will be available for general release in July 2023. So the Squiz Customer Data Platform, it collects data in a really governed way uh, from all different sources. We've got web, mobile, CRM, call center, Internet of Things sensors, if you want, uh, and it unifies it to create accurate customer profiles in real time. And then it makes that profile accessible to and actionable by other tools and technology. We are building the CDP for Squiz customers. So there's a lot of CDPs out there in the market, but they really focus in on e-commerce use cases and use how do we use customer data to generate more retail sales. We're not focusing on those. We're really building out the features we know our customers need. So we're going to enable easy and simple content personalization, de-siloing customer data so that you can build a lot more personalized experiences and giving you tools to measure the return on investment for all of this work that you're doing. So, see here. So this is an example of the CDP. So if I want to really easily add in Canvas as a new data source, I'm the University of Windsor, and I want to add in Canvas as a new data source inside my CDP. Because this works flawlessly with the rest of the DXP, we have all of the pre-built connect recipes available inside the UI. So I can just click on the Canvas uh, LMS recipe there, configure the fields that come by default, add in any extra ones that I would like to pull through, and then I just uh, tick which fields I would like to pull into that single customer view. It's really simple. We have other ways, obviously, for any uh, sources that might not have a Connect recipe yet. And as Gav said, you can talk to Carrie and ask for any recipe to be built for you. But we also have all the different APIs that you would need to pull in data from any source that you can. 
So here's all the data that's stored in our CDP. It's in a really easy to simple to use interface, so you can view all the different data. You can see analytical data on the different segments. You can see all the different ways that your customers are interacting with your digital experiences here. And you can drill down and look at individual customer profiles. So this is Maria. Uh, you can kind of see, I'm just gonna point to this screen, sorry everyone. So you can see down here, you know, she was browsing around the website, she watched a couple of videos, she did some course searches, and then she signed up for an open day submission. And now we know who she is. So we know her name, we know her email address, and she was even kind enough to give us a photo. And that enhances the profile. We can already see, so we already had all the things that she said that she was interested in, because that's what she was using, and now we know more about her. So she's still a prospective student. But if she likes what she hears at the open day, she may actually convert into an enrolled student. And all of the data that comes with that, interests, clubs, courses, GPA, can all be linked into this profile. Uh, we can, if we choose, also link up third-party data sources to further enhance those customer profiles, if you want to. So the history of Maria and the history of all of your customers, it grows over time, stitching together that story of prospective student to enrolled student to engaged alumni. And you can do this with all of your customer data, making it a lot simpler to de-silo and see who is actually interacting with you. So we've, we added in a new data source. We had a look at what kind of data we were pulling through. Now we want to make a segment. We want to do some website personalization. Let's say we want to show a special module just to business students. So here is the new way that you can create segments uh, for customer personalization or anything that you want. You can see here, uh, Gav talked about earlier around having really precise business rules. So it's a lot more complex uh, and intuitive to use in the current way you can build out those segments or personas inside Matrix. Um, so you can build out uh, the segments for as much as you want. And those segments are DXP wide. So you can then send it to Matrix to use for content personalization. You can send it to Funnelback to be integrated with Funnelback's existing search personalization. You can send it anywhere you want. They can be sent to any other CMS that enables content personalization. It doesn't just have to be Matrix. So it means that we're making it really easy for you to centralize your personalization and use it everywhere, across all platforms and across all your different systems. I think I've gone backwards. So with the Squiz CDP, you'll be able to build personalized and customized portals, websites, and internets really simply and quickly. So working together with the component model, portal development time, integration time, building data-driven applications and integrations, all of these are gonna be really, really fast. Um, so that's gonna make it a lot easier for you to meet what your goals are and even go beyond them. So with Squiz as your partner in personalization, you can really deeply understand your customers and help them get exactly what they need more efficiently. Building up that deeper relationship that evolves over time and allowing your digital experiences to evolve with them. Uh, I, we mentioned Carrie earlier, but if you would like to learn more, Carrie is up the back somewhere still. Uh, she'll be out there, but of course, please contact your account manager uh, if you are also interested in being an early access customer. So this will be available for general release around the middle of next year, but we're looking for anyone who is interested in, being, in working really closely with us uh, to build out their solutions so that we can make sure that we are building the Squiz CDP. All right, announcement number three. Every single one of you have at least one form, all of you. So we know they're really important. We also know content editors need to be able to more easily self-service on forms. Even the complex ones that, as Gav mentioned, have conditional logic and payment gateways and all of the fun things that you want to add into your forms to really self-service. We also want to make collecting that form data and using that data for doing other things a lot more intuitive. So forms, as you saw with the example with Maria, are a really great way to learn more about your customers, and we want to make that a lot more easy and flexible. So we are building the next evolution of forms. It'll be in beta testing mid next year and general release in September 2023. <laughs> so we're really focused on making them a lot easier to use, uh, and non-technical users will be able to easily and simply create forms and the data will be saved. And of course, this will obviously integrate deeply with the Sitquiz CDP to make sure that we're building up that progressive profile over time. 
So there's a lot of a lot of cool features that we're going to have in these new forms. Uh, so non-technical users will be able to take advantage of all of these. A drag and drop builder, so being able to much more easily create forms with a drag and drop interface. Multiple defi default field types and field validation. Uh, we've mentioned conditional logic a few times. So conditional logic, multi-page forms for those really complex ones. You know who you are. Uh, and easy payment gateway options. We don't currently make it very easy for you to get money from your customers, and we'd like to make it a lot easier. Uh, and then the ability to embed digital signatures. We know this is very important, especially for our government clients. So a few designs. So you can see here, so within the Squiz C, uh, DXP console, you'll be able to see a list of all of the different forms that you currently have available. Uh, check the views, responses, look at trends and responses, for example. We're also really focusing on trying to make the forms easy to use. So you can see here, there's the number of different form fields that are available. You can drag them over and build up your form uh, easily with really simple methods for both complex and, sim and uh, simple types of different uh, fields, and also having different types of styling and themes that can be built by your developer team. So once built, the forms can be really easily embedded inside websites using Matrix, uh, using the new component system inside Matrix. So it'll be easy to see all of the different available forms and embed them into your content. And you need to be able to preview them to make sure that you can see contextually what the form looks like inside the rest of your content. So if you would like to learn more about forms, talk about how you use your current forms and make sure that all the work that we're doing is going to make your lives all a lot easier, Eugene is right there. Uh, so please <laughs> bail him up outside and ask all of your forms questions or contact your account manager. Again, we are looking for early access customers who'd like to work with us to make sure we're doing the right thing. All right, so I said I had three big announcements, and, but I have a couple of other things I'd like to share with you on our roadmap over the next 12 or 10 months that I'd like to also talk about. Search and insights. So we have a really exciting roadmap for Funnelback with a number of improvements being rolled out over the next year. So by mid next year, we're going to incorporate uh, rendered page content in final back searches. I know this is something that a lot of people have been asking for and we're going to be delivering it. We're also building a much more user-friendly version of Curator, which we're referring to as Curator 2.0. It's going to be a lot easier to manipulate content before and after it's indexed with our new plugin model. So there'll be an existing catalog of plugins that you can download from the Squiz Marketplace and use, or you can build your own really easily. And this will let you transform <laughs> content prior to indexing it and make sure that you get the best search results for your customers. One really exciting thing is there's a lot of analytics inside Funnelback and we're moving to more active analytics. So at the moment, you have to remember to go and look at all your dashboards to see what's going on. Instead, you're going to receive nudges and alerts when something of interest happens, complete with the what, the why, and recommendations for next steps. We're also really improving the usability of Funnelback. We want to make it easier for people to configure and set up through guided user journeys. And lastly, but probably most importantly, we are really focusing in on improving the core search functionality. We're using all of the new advances in AI that we can build into it to make sure our search and insights offering is going to be even better. So as Gav put sort of something like this slide on the earlier, which is you all have the DXP, which is true. You do all have access to the DXP right now, but we want to make it easier to access as well. So when you buy a composable DXP, you're still buying a platform. You can use a different CMS or a different integrations partner or multiple integration partners, but they need to talk. You need certainty of what is going on across all of your digital experiences. So as part of that, we are refreshing the DXP console to make it easier for you to get access to all the products you have, as well as, as Gav mentioned, uh, we're giving everyone who doesn't already have access evaluation versions of our search product, Funnelback, our integrations, iPads Connect, and our data services product, Data Store. So you'll be able to get evaluation versions, try what you like, um, you know, buy what you love, and then pay for what you're actually using. But as part of that, we also need to give you the, that, that talking, the connecting the parts of the composable DXP. So we're building out two extra areas here. You can see insights and optimize. 
So insights is where you'll see tools that'll give content editors, marketers, communications uh, professionals and developers more ways to understand your customers and how your sites are being experienced. So I spoke earlier around Funnelback moving to active instead of passive insights, and all of these will be active insights. They'll enable you to get nudges when your site isn't performing the way you expect and tips on how you can improve it before your customers even notice. Optimize is where you'll find tools that'll let you improve your digital experiences for your customers. Aimed at marketers and communication professionals, we'll be rolling out a lot more ways to optimize your sites, including you know, powerful AI integrations that'll identify and offer suggestions to fix any bottlenecks that your customers may be experiencing on your sites. So I said I had three big announcements, so just to recap, we have the DXP components coming in March next year. We have the customer data platform coming in July, and we have advanced forms coming in September. As Gav said, we are all, we have, all of these are being worked on right now. We also have, over the next year, we, improvements to the DXP console, making it easier for you to access the products you already have, and updates to Funnelback to make our search experience even stronger. So we said at the beginning, we've been talking all day, we are building the most composable DXP in the world, the easiest DXP to use, the DXP that gives you faster time to value, faster time for your customers seeing how your organization can serve them. This roadmap is how Squeeze will enable you to reach your organization's visions and goals faster and easier. We'll flexibly integrate with the, with the technology that you want and let you come as you are. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. That was fantastic. Great to see uh, the innovation and roadmap that's ahead of us. Uh, thank you, Nat, though, for showing us what's actually capable uh, right now as well. Uh, about to introduce our next speaker from Squiz. Uh, and then, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we've got a couple of uh, customer presentations uh, that we'll hear from stories uh, from customers there. Uh, so next up, though, is our head of customer transformation, Anthony Negro. I've had the pleasure of working with Anthony for many years now. Uh, he's been a key member of the Squiz team working across uh, uh, many different roles, and he has the uh, big responsibility at the moment of bringing our customers on our journey to SaaS. So he's going to uh, present and speak to us about that. Anthony. Cheers, Ed. Uh, a lot of people think I'm really technical in my role, uh, but the short answer is I think I'm technical enough to be dangerous. So what I often do is work at the intersection of our customers' digital strategies and how to leverage technology to advance digital experience. And that, that's tough, because we always want to use the best tech available, but it's not always an easy path. And I'm sure you're all really energized about the, the roadmap that we've got, all the features that we've got, but uh, we still have this aspiration gap. Digital isn't easy. There's a lot of tools to wrangle. There's a lot of objectives that we need to hit. And very much that's our focus as an organization, ensuring that you, our customers, that you can bring your people, the technology that you've got, you can come as you are, and you can help to close this aspiration gap, meaning you can deliver more faster. And the way I want to talk about that is to actually look at what are we doing at the moment to help advance our customers. And we've got a great story from one of our most recent customers, University of Sunshine Coast. They joined us this year, and their challenge was to create a personalized student portal. They have many different disparate systems across their organization. Uh, they needed to make sure that it was compelling and personalized and, of course, secure. So in partnership with the wonderful team, and we've got Tracy here uh, today who's gonna be presenting, uh, we were able to design a unique experience, integrate with many different systems within that organization seamlessly, but most impressively by using templates, components, things that we have available, the Edify uh, components that Nat talked about, we were able to deliver together a student portal within four months. Now, I think that's pretty remarkable to be able to deliver such a highly valuable tool to a university within such a short time frame. The added benefits they have, though, is they're using the right tools for the job. So they've got Connect, gathering services, gathering information from other parts of the business. 
They've got data store to be able to use that and transform that information. But what is also great is they're doing that on our SaaS platform. And that means they're never gonna have to upgrade ever. They can focus on their digital experience for their students and keep progressing it that forward. Now, to me, that means that they don't have to manage infrastructure. They don't have to manage releases or change things for their teams. They can literally think of what is the best, nest, best next thing for our students and deliver upon that. So why have we done this? That's a great compelling reason, but I just want to dive into the why we've done this. Because for our customers, many of you who I've known for many, many years now, we have delivered a very rock solid service. But we can't stand still because we know that our industry is changing. Your needs are changing. But what we're told through industry is that we need to have really strong cloud native applications that can grow and scale with our business seamlessly. This is necessary. We also know, as JP talked about as well, that we need to be able to have a composable experience or applications. And that's data, but as well as services from other, um, I was going to say services from other services. It doesn't sound that great, but I'll keep on moving. Um, but that's important. And we have to make sure it's a good experience for our customers, but also our internal staff. Yeah, we can't break the backs of our teams just to make a good experience. We need to have the right tools available for people. And beyond that, we're all living in this now. We have distributed teams, people working in the office, people out remote, from a university perspective, people at campus, off campus, but everyone needs to get a really good and consistent experience. So these are factors that are driving us and things that we consider when we do our roadmap and look at what we need to deliver. The other most important thing is, as Ed talked about, we listen to our customers. And, and they need to deliver a rock solid service to their customers. And security, I was just watching the news this morning, another large organization has a threat around security. So we need to make sure that we've got security considered, that we've got agile environments, and that we can keep improving our performance over time. And for that reason, we have our Squiz DXP SaaS. I've got fireworks. We spent all of our money on the SaaS platform, not on the fireworks, yeah? So um, that's cool. So what are the benefits? What do you get through a SaaS platform? So I've been really proud of the fact that every single one of our customers has received an upgrade at least once a year. Yeah, so you get new features, new functionality, ready for you to use. But that's not fast enough. Our ambition is we want to have everyone, the right tools in their hand immediately. When you're on the latest version, your projects are more efficient. Look at the case of the University of Sunshine Coast really efficient because they're not having to consider what technical debt will be in the future. They're just using the best practice at all times. But if we can get you our product features faster, our feedback loop is actually drastically improved as well. So instead of having to wait for 12 months before someone's using the latest version, we can release it and get feedback instantly. So our pace of innovation is gonna speed up drastically by using this, this approach. And on that point, I feel like our upgrade process, and some of you might not enjoy it, but it is actually really great. So right now, for our existing customers, you can go through a process with limited UAT and actually get out and have your entire organization systems upgraded, which is pretty remarkable. But through great, uh, great engineering and architecture, we've actually been able to limit that effort altogether. And by making sure that people are on the latest version with smaller, more frequent updates, we can be really confident of the upgrade service that we've got. And that's why now we have frictionless upgrades as part of SAS. Oh, cheers, Ed. You're a bit too excited. <laughs> calm down. Calm down, Ed. There's more to come. I'm no. Um, and everything that our team is doing, so Matrix 6, Funnelback 16, all of the roadmap of things that we're doing, it's part of this journey. So we've got SaaS that's going to have all this functionality. But, of course, we need to make sure that you're, you're able to come as you are, and we will bring people up to SaaS, but we're also going to make sure that our roadmap, or the, the, the parts that our customers need, will be available to Squiz Cloud and SaaS. Yeah? There might be some differences, but we want to make sure that everyone can get that benefit. 
Some other features that come with SaaS is we've partnered with Amazon Web Services to build out our new architecture, and that means we're introducing some new facilities that we haven't had in the past. So we're taking the guesswork out of scalability. So right now, we have to try and predict when we're gonna have traffic peaks. Uh, the future, or what's available via SaaS, is the environment can just grow. You don't need to plan, you've just got confidence of both Squiz and our partner Amazon Wind Services that things are just gonna work. And that's built upon a rock solid service that we've already had for our customers as well. And we're also transitioning away from a disaster recovery approach, still rock solid, still works really, really well, but in SaaS, we're able to offer a different kind of an approach, a focus on high availability. So we're gonna have less trade-offs. So we're gonna have highly available, something that's replicated across multiple zones within your local region, um, but that means you don't need to have authoring freezes or wondering how you're gonna synchronize data afterwards, or more importantly, for your customers, their forms are gonna be able to work through that entire process. So something different, but these are benefits that we're able to deliver through your SaaS platform. Now, what's involved in a migration? We've spent a lot of time ensuring that we've got a path for every one of our customers. We've made the process as simple as possible. The biggest step in the journey is actually upgrading to Matrix 6. So if you've done that, you're almost a foot into SaaS already. But beyond that, we can go through that process, upgrade you to the latest version, and then we'll make sure that we'll, we'll bring you across to SaaS. And we recognize that this is a change for your organization. What we've got is rock solid. We need to make sure you're really comfortable with this approach for your organization as a change to them. So we want to change together. But the process is simple. We've updated our agreements to make sure that you can use the right products within the DXP. Um, I can't say it as well as Julian and, and Legend. Thanks, Nat. Um, but you know, try what you want and, and pay for what you need is really what we're trying to set up um, through this change. So that means together we'll go on this journey and we will make sure that we've got a tailored plan to be able to bring you forward to SaaS when it suits you as a customer. So if you want to know more, of course your account managers are aware of the plans that we have for you, but alternatively we've got an email address that you can reach out to, you can find out more, uh, transformation at squiz.net. And yes, we do recognize this is a, a, lot, a lot of change and so we've got our panel discussion this afternoon, uh, headed by a lot of experts around this space. As I said, the technical people that, that know stuff, not like pretend to know stuff like me, uh, but they're gonna be able to go through all the questions that you have. And I think the end goal is we wanna make sure that you can keep focusing on creating great experiences and not worry about the administration or managing infrastructure. So thank you everyone, and uh, please reach out if any questions. Thank you, Anthony. That was uh, fantastic. And yes, we are bringing our customers on the journey with us. All right, we're just going to um, set up for our next session. Let's move on. Um, so we're going to have a, uh, a Q&A session. Fireside chat, we advertised it as. I'm d very disappointed that there is no fire though. Um, apparently there were ordinance issues, we couldn't, um, we couldn't do that on the day. But nonetheless, uh, the session is going to be fantastic. So I would like to welcome to the stage, uh, Jason Beaumont's going to join me, Director of Queensland Online. Jason. <laughs> Hello Jason. Hi Ed. How are you going? Good, thanks. That's it's good. Working. Yes. We got we got one of these each. Um, so, Jason, you, as I say, are director uh, Queensland Online. Uh, Queensland Online is part of Smart Service Queensland. Yep. Uh, and I think of Smart Service Queensland as sort of the front door to Queensland government. Yeah. Um, you run uh, multiple channels there. So there's the digital channel. Uh, you've uh, run the call centre um, uh, for people to access uh, over the phone. And there's also a whole bunch of uh, in-person service centres across, spread across Queensland. So that multi-channel sort of access, I suppose, is really important to the Queensland Government strategy? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's something that Queensland Government takes very seriously. You know, Smart Service Queensland is very well positioned. As you said, we've got call centres, um, customer service in-person um, counter services, we call it, and we've got our digital capability. And I think um, 
what we do that's probably a little different to general retail or um, other customer service streams is we don't push use those other channels to push to our digital to save money. We actually ensure that each of these channels um, have a, a capability of first point of contact resolution um, because we're, we're government. You know, we have a responsibility. Um, we have an all-inclusive target audience, mm -hmm. you know, from birth to, to the ultimate end. Um, and everything in between and, you know, not everyone's comfortable with digital, as you know. So finding the, comfort uh, the most comfortable point of interaction for the customer is what we strive for. Yep. Fantastic. And, and that sort of customer centricity goes, uh, as you say, you don't push everyone into that digital realm, but certainly uh, Queensland Online, you're responsible for the qld.gov.au sort of main landing point for, for Queensland Government. That itself is sort of structured, um, it's referred to as a franchise model, so yep. information's drawn in from the various departments and agencies. You're not expecting a citizen to understand the makeup of government and its complexities. Yeah. Um, that that citizen-centric view is really important. Absolutely. I think we learnt a long time ago, um, people don't come to government websites for entertainment purposes. Really? Okay. Funnily <laughs> enough. Uh, they usually come infrequently, uh, but for a specific purpose. Yeah. Uh, so our goal is to make that as easy uh, interaction as possible um, and to do that we, we shouldn't expect them to know how government is structured and mm. which department is responsible for which service or part of a service and, and that's what we have a lot of is you know you pay your rego, you're, you're paying some tax to the Queensland Revenue Office, you're paying some uh, maintenance to the TMR, you're doing something else over here. Customers shouldn't need to know that. So. This franchised user-centric approach, the qld.gov.au is our front door. Um, it's built in a way that relates to customers and the journeys, um, but it's also using language that they should be relating to. Now, we can always do better, and we always strive to do better, but that's the goal. Um, as you know, government language can be quite confusing and, and misleading if you're not working in government, so that's where we're heading. Beautiful. So it's a strong strategy being rolled out um, within Queensland Government and, and as you say that citizen centricity is built in. Uh, within government you've got quite a lot of time usually for planning, uh, getting things right. Um, there's a big focus on security, accessibility, uh, getting the right tools uh, there, the right sign-offs are done. Uh, and then along comes COVID uh, and the world yeah. changes uh, and you're expected to, it, to do everything tomorrow. Um, yeah, so that's a, a huge impact, but I think your team has uh, responded so admirably. So can you just share a little bit of, of that experience? Yeah, I'm, I, we're very lucky. We had an amazing team, have an amazing team. Um, and COVID certainly changed things around and, and put things on its head. Uh, we went from, as you said, all the time in the world, in a, in a manner of speaking, as far as risk profile and, you know, ticking all the boxes and navigating the red tape. COVID, there was no appetite for that. And it was immediate. We had Queensland Police legis uh, enforcing legislation that Queensland Health were responsible for under a Health Direction Act. Um, obviously, Queensland Health go through mock processes and, and they have all their plans in pr place. But until you're actually in these things and understanding how um, citizens react and society reacts, it, it was a difficult situation. So the way we worked had to change um, and we became far more reactive but our risk appetite changed dramatically to meet that mm -hmm. as well. Um, and and there were, it was amazingly challenging mm. but there were so many great outcomes as a result mm. of that. Um, yeah. I'd like to pick that up actually because I know um, a, a number of things, you know, there's the COVID site itself that was put up, the informational site, a number of different services were required. Uh, one in particular was the border pass um, system yeah. that was put up and I know um, a, a huge effort from your team, from the vendors supporting you, um, complex sort of technology integrations were required and again in a very short amount of time. So mm. could you just give us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was an extremely short amount of time. I was only talking to Varney, one of our superstars, 
uh, this morning, actually. And what she said she took away from that was um, what she remembers is looking at the news and seeing hours, if not days, of waiting at borders for people to cross. Yeah. Um, and, and it was kind of at that point that we were approached to go, what can, what can you guys do to help? Now, we're, to keep it in mind, our day-to-day -day is not full-on development. Um, we've got development capability, but we usually coordinate agencies to do their own development. But our team were able to step up and kind of look through our bag of tricks and uh, call upon the great relationships of our vendors like Squiz um, and uh, use Squiz platform but also some Form.io mm -hmm. uh, capability and uh, pull together a, a system <laughs> that not only was easy to use and easy to navigate for the customer yep. but could change rapidly, hourly if required, to meet the ever-evolving legislation and new laws that were coming into place around keeping Queensland safe. Mm, mm. Um, it was quite challenging. And, and quite a, I mean, amazing uptake from uh, some of the quotes, uh, the figures you'd, you'd quoted yeah, previously. Ab absolutely. I, I think one of our high watermarks fairly early on the piece was 50,000 applications in an hour. Yeah. Um, we were doing multiple releases a week at points. And these releases would happen at 1am because, you know, that's when it was decided to be the best time to coordinate between daylight savings in Queensland and New South Wales and all of that. But, um, yeah, we, we would see thousands of applications within minutes of doing a new border release because you'd have industry sitting there waiting, trucks waiting at the border going, well, we need to get freight across. The new rules come in in an hour... Mm. They're sitting there with their iPads yeah. in their trucks, filling in these things as we hit the button. Pretty amazing. That's incredible. It, it's really meaningful work, wasn't it? I mean, it, um, and I think you know, just even talking to, to customers today and the reaction from, from the teams, there's a, there's a general theme here in terms of, of what people were, were able to achieve and the impact that we were having um, on the broader community at large. Mm. And, um, and really te teams feeling like they're doing the best work of their lives in, in some respects uh, during that time. How did that play out with your team? Absolutely. Um, I certainly personally feel it's the best work of my life. Um, but it, I think from government point of view, the people we attract generally have a bit of a community spirit yeah. about them. Um, it, it's more than money. And if you have a look at government wages, it's, it's always more than money because we don't get paid what some of the um, you know, private industry can pay, especially in contracting. But I think uh, Varney mentioned it best this morning when she said to, be, to see that border line-up, to get that call, to come up with a solution and within days watching those borders go from two days sitting at a border to a couple of hours after working, you know, around the clock to do that, she said, I had a look on the news and I felt extremely rewarded, you know. So we, we do the, um, some surveying every year in Queensland Government. It's called Working for Queensland and, and it's anonymous surveying but it can... It goes down to a team level and in my team in particular, um, the... The feeling over work component, sitting at 85% during that period. And it was understandable. Like, we were a small team working crazy hours. But the, the key point to take out was job satisfaction for that exact same period was 95%. And that was a high watermark. We'd never, ever achieved that before. So there's something to take away from that, too. You know, it, it's, it's not necessarily the amount of work, but the type of work and the value of the work. Awesome. Um, I think you've, you've proven what's possible. Absolutely. Um, you've got the technology platforms, uh, vendors and obviously team that, mm. can, that can do that. Uh, cut through the red tape uh, that might be in government at times and, and sign-offs and those sorts of things. Um, what next, though? How do you take that forward? Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, well, that's a difficult thing, isn't it? Like, obviously, we've got a whole range of learnings that we um, want to take on board. And there's a whole range of things that we'd love to keep on going. Of course, adrenaline can't be a component of that. <laughs> uh, even though it, it worked really well for us, it's, it's not sustainable. But I think 
making sure that we're working to a, a more appropriate risk appetite. I think BAU for so long, um, it, it kind of gets you into this lull of let's triple check, let's quadruple check, you know, before we can sign things off. Yeah. Um, I think what COVID proved was we can get things out quick. Yeah. And if we, if we take a more agile approach, we get things out, we iterate, we, we adapt, we, we adjust as we go along, yeah. it, it reduces risk in a different way and it makes it easier to get to market for our customers who are inevitably waiting for us yeah. at the end of the day. So um, th there's also workforce planning stuff that we need to revisit as well, um, but that's that's much longer term and more government centric. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, we look forward to helping you into the future, Jason. We've been very proud of, of our part that we've been able to play there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, congratulations to you and the team and, and what you've achieved through that period. And uh, we look forward to seeing what you achieve out into the future. Yeah. Thanks very, very much for joining us today, though. Thanks for having me. That's great. Thank you. Cheers. All right, thanks, uh, Jason, and uh, we'll just do a little bit of a rejig here. I'm going to welcome up to the stage our Chief Marketing Officer, May Coon. May, can you take over? Oh, you yes, want that? I can. Yeah. Okay, and you're all done. Just check the mic. Can everyone hear me now? Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, we'd love to get our panellists up here. Welcome, everybody, to the customer panel. The last thing before lunch. You're going to love this session, guys. Oh. Love it. <laughs> So as the panelists are coming up, um, just a quick introduction. I'm May. Uh, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Squiz. And I joined in January this year. And as you would have heard throughout the day, what an exciting time to have joined. The only thing that would sweeten it is if I made it past probation. So Gaff, <laughs> Helen. Fingers crossed. All right, all right. Better perform here. So. It's my privilege today to have these three Squiz changemakers here sharing their journey, some really interesting journeys. They've done some really fantastic things in the higher education space, but regardless of really any industry that you're in, you're in a service-driven organization, and we all really face very similar challenges. Um, so I guarantee you that you're gonna get something out of this that you can take back to the ranch and apply straight away. You have a ranch, don't you? Uh, <laughs> So um, let's pivot to our panelists first. So uh, on the far right over there, we have Andrew Jayatilaka, as he's known to his parents only, AJ to the rest of us. So AJ is the digital director at Macquarie University, which is uh, rated as one of the top 1% uh, of universities worldwide, serving 44,000 customers who are students globally. Then we have Tracy Moore, who is manager of student experience. She's from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Um, really 28 years young university. Um, it's ranked as the second, uh, second ranked public university in Australia and also one of the fastest growing. And over here, Adam, oh, I like that, Ed. Just keep doing the use. <laughs> here we have Adam Taylor. Uh, he's the head of digital creative and he's at the University of Newcastle, which is uh, amongst the top 200 universities worldwide and serving, again, a large number of student customers, 30, 37,000, I believe. I do check my facts. Oh, yeah, there you go. So this is how we're going to run the panel really quickly. I'm going to dive into a key project that each of them have embarked on recently, and then we'll do a lightning round, uh, round robin of questions where we kind of get to understand what they've learned over their extensive careers and what they think 2023 will look like for us. So ready? <laughs> so, uh, AJ. So, um, AJ, uh, just a quick introduction to AJ. He's the kind of person that uh, my parents wish I grew up to be. So, he finished his MBA at London Business School. And then he started his career on the other side of the fence, uh, consulting actually at the likes of Capgemini. Then he moved in house, um, leading gr digital growth initiatives at the BBC and then Telstra. And then he moved to Macquarie University in 2018. And here we are. So can you tell us a little bit about your role as digital director? Yeah, sure. Um, so digital bleeds into different things in different organizations. At our organization, 
for us digital is our website, so mq.edu.au, all our one-to-one -one communications, marketing automation, and any of the beautiful digital advertising that you see on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or search, that's, that's us as well. So I do know that we, we saw actually a screen of GEM, which is your Global Experience Macquarie Design System. Now that's really extensive, it's a complex piece that you've been working on for more than a year, more than a couple of years. Um, you're about to roll that out and launch that. Tell us why that was so valuable to Macquarie and to your students. Yeah, sure. So we complete our GEM rollout mid next year. Um, so we started about three years ago when we developed it. And it was important because we had so many different user experiences. So we had blue buttons, white buttons, red buttons, buttons that didn't look like buttons. So for a user who came onto our website, it was really hard to know what, what do you want to do? What do you want me to do? Um, and so it did, it did one thing for our users. It made it really simple for you to understand what it is that you wanted to do. Do what it says on the tin. Um, and then for our engineering side, it made our system scalable and robust. So devs can write in the same way that designers can write. There are many different ways to code a component. And so we did have a whole bunch of spaghetti code throughout the, throughout the site. And so what um, the design system does, it does those two things. For the user, super clear what you want me to do, and then some robustness on the engineering side. So two and a half years in, what, how has it gone? How has it gone for the you and the team and the students? Yeah, it's gone well. well. I mean, it's variable, right? There are some things that go really well. And we kind of gloss over the things that, that, that don't go well. There are some things that are really hard. And every, you know, if you're at a university or you're, you're a government service, they're all big institutions. There are some things that go, go better than others. But we measure. And before we started our journey, our NPS score was, was minus nine. So more people you know, did not like us than liked us. And now we are at are closer to, to plus 30 depending on which element of the site, our hospital site or our product site. So to, you know, to, 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 to kind of achieve that over that period, we're really proud of it. And every time we, um, we release a component of GEM, the scores on the doors go up. So we've got one more to go. That's the bit that we, that we, we have to go. Also, um, for our team, it makes, it makes a massive difference. We have a great team that they're over there in the back corner. So make sure you say hello to them and they're lurking over there. And what, Definitely. What? Raise your hand table. <laughs> you want to see the rock stars. There you go. And what it does for them is they can have really mature conversations with us. Everyone's a marketer. Everyone knows how to build a website. Everyone wants the button to be blue and over there. But um, what it does, it gives them a really kind of a great toolkit to have a really mature conversation with the user who has a problem that we're trying to, we're trying to solve for them. So and I think that's really great because uh, normally design systems, people don't think about how that impacts the NPS score. Um, so I think this is really unique what you've done and, and how you've been able to measure that. Now, obviously any project has learnings. Um, so if you were to go back and do this again, yeah. what would you do the same way and what yeah. would you do differently? So what I would do the same is, um, is not build a lot of bespoke. So what you see on that slide is those are the components. And there are so many different businesses that we run within our business. So we, you know, and, and I think everyone in the audience is the same. So we run our website, Prospective Students In. We also have a hospital, we have gym, we have cafes and restaurants, we have a massive research community, but we haven't built different things for them. We've built, here are your 40 components, and we'll click, click, click different kind of Lego blocks depending on what your, um, on what your need is. And we haven't created a lot of variability because then that creates more code, more development overhead. So I would, I would maintain the rage when it comes to um, the number of components that you build. That's what I would do again. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, and I'll move you to Tracy, the rose amongst the thorns there. Uh, really nice thorns, I have to say. So, <laughs> Tracy is manager of student experience at UniSC, as we'll call it. Um, now, she has an extensive experience in financial services in higher education, and you joined UniSC eight years ago, first in the student central team, and then today you lead the student experience team. 
Um, so there's no doubt that you love the customer experience. And just a quick tip or, or fact, actually, I found out that you're a bit of a serial entrepreneur. Started a few businesses on the side over the years. So uh, if any of you has a side hustle that you're looking forward to getting some advice on, there she is. So Tracy, please tell us a little bit about your role at UniSE. So um, I'm the manager of student experience and that means I have all the student centres reporting into me. So they're doing our um, future student and current student inquiries across all channels. And I also manage our business improvement team, which is the good stuff. So we're doing um, some student systems and projects, process improvements, etc. So that's the good bit that's, where I got to do the, the portal. That's the good bit? Okay. You're going to keep the bad bits out? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Deal. So uh, we do know, as you've seen earlier um, when Anthony was presenting, talked about your project that you uh, have recently launched. Um, this is one of those things, one of those projects that kind of remains talked about in hushed tones, in dark corridors, the student portal project, because uh, it's so hard. So tell us a little bit about why that was important for UniSC and how, how was that journey like for you? Uh, well, it was fast. It was <laughs> fast and furious, um, and that was the good thing about it. I think I probably wouldn't have coped with two and a half years. Uh, we have, like all unis, too many systems for students to navigate and we needed to do something about that. Um, hopefully there's no one from our IT team here or watching online, but bless them, they uh, tried <laughs> to build a portal app a few years ago for us just pre-COVID and pretty much, funnily enough, tried to replicate the TransLink app and it wasn't really useful, they didn't talk to anyone and they just uh, decided to do that. We found out about it and thankfully the, the project halted there and then um, <laughs> come, come COVID, obviously everything changed. Our digital experience for students was really under the spotlight at that point and it became obvious that we needed to do something and this time we decided to work with someone that knew what they were doing. So uh, we worked with That's Swiss, nice. which was good. Um, and the most important thing of that was actually just talking to students because our IT team decided they knew what was needed. I'd argue they didn't, um, and the, the consultation we did with students proved that they didn't. So we did that, um, did a lot of student consultation before we even decided on the MVP that we went with, and uh, rolled it out very quickly. Very quickly, four months, wasn't it? Yeah, something around that. <laughs> <laughs> that period of your life just flashed before your eyes. Yeah, so it's called the, COVID, uh, the, the portal haze. My, the portal uh, haze, no, my there's, there's a term for you guys yeah. to take back. So um, the ability to integrate like the spaghetti of systems and data and content, that was a really big deal for you. Yeah. Um, tell us why that was a game changer. Well, funnily enough, um, earlier when it was said that integrations can just happen, that has not been my experience <laughs> at the uni, um, and they seem to take a lot more work than, than expected. But the most... Um, I guess we had a choice. We have a lot of systems, as I said. We could have just maybe slapped a login screen on the front end and hoped that they'd use that, but obviously I don't think that would have added any value. So we've brought a lot of integration into the portal. I'm not a technical person. I have no idea how difficult integrations are. Um, I now understand that they're more difficult than I realised. And so when I just said, let's integrate everything and put it on the front page and everyone went white, now I know why. Um, but we, we brought a calendar in which was really good. So, again, like most unis, you've got a, um, a class timetable that sits on one, um, like on your student management system. We had an exam timetable. We had um, course due dates, uh, assignment due dates on another system. We've got um, appointments and workshops on another system. So we've brought those into one calendar for students and I think that's been probably the most... Um, the biggest ticket item, certainly. And then the other thing that I think has been really good um, is using Funnelback. So that enterprise search has just been a godsend. And frankly, the staff are using it probably as much as the students because our That's corporate great. website is, again, hope no one's watching, but frankly, a nightmare to navigate <laughs> as well. So using Funnelback for um, searching across our FAQs, our portal content, our corporate website has just been amazing. That's amazing. And uh, we can't wait to get to that site soon. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. So, so how has it gone so far? How has the student portal project 
plug that on. It works. It's not broken. Yes. Um, yeah, Time no. stamped, 8th of November, 2022. <laughs> yeah, no, it, uh, it's going really well. We did a very soft launch. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, under-promising and over-delivering, so I really didn't even want to tell anyone. So we went very quietly live. Um, and we got a really good uptake, despite the fact that we weren't really um, promoting it to anyone. But yeah, working really well. Inbound inquiries have somewhat reduced. I don't know if it's all due to the portal, um, but I'd like to think that students are able to find things that they need easier than they could before. I think we'll take, I will take I think that as a, I think we can count it. I think we can. Yeah. Um, so what, again, same question, what would you do the same? What would you have done differently with hindsight? Uh, the same, I would do an MVP again like we've done. So we've, we've built a few good things. We've got a long list of things we, we'd like to think about down the track. But I think doing something small and seeing how, um, how our students use it and what, what we need to do next, I would definitely do that again. Uh, and what I'd do differently is um, the thing I didn't mention was that we actually had changed our LMS um, sort of six to 12 months prior. And I would never, ever, ever roll out one system, <laughs> new system on the back of another major system because there was a fair amount of uh, fatigue amongst staff having to navigate a new system. Mm. Um, we, we were so excited with the portal. We've got this great shiny new system and all our academics can use it to talk to their students. And it was crickets from some areas. So, yeah, it was just like... And, and you thought system. you had communicated... Oh, we have. I mean, we, yeah, yes. But I don't think you can do enough. That's right. Yeah, you've just got to keep talking to them and just because you show them and invite them and try and drag them along on the journey, they don't all come with you. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we've all learned from that before. Yeah. I think that's good advice. Um, so, Adam. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm very good now. Um, so... Adam uh, is head of digital creative at University of Newcastle. Um, and Adam, you have really come full circle. You studied design at the University of Newcastle. I did, I did indeed. And now you lead kind of digital creative and design at the University of Newcastle. I do indeed. So when your parents asked you, son, what do you want to do when you grow up and where do you want to study, you weren't kidding like the rest of us. Well, I wanted to play cricket for Australia, but I ended up All right. um, working at the Missed University Missed that of one on my yeah. research. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but you are creative at heart. You're also a musician. You love building beautiful customer experiences, love collaborating with people in a room. So anyone out there as well who wants to collaborate and throw some ideas around with the creative over here, I do hear he loves his craft beers, maybe. Oh, I've been known to dabble. Oh, been known to dumb. Well, if you need a hint on how to get his attention later during drinks, we see you, Juan. So, Adam, tell us a little bit about your role as head of digital creative. Um, well, m my role is, you know, I, is to be as, as creative and as crazy as possible under the guise of strategy. Oh, I love that. So, you know, I have to be strategic as, as I can, but I like to come up with really sort of far out ideas, bring it all back in and sort of wrap it all up and I've got an amazing team that just makes stuff happen. And um, you sort of go, wow, that's, yeah, that's kind of what I thought it would look like. But yeah, but under the, under the guise of strategy. Hello. Ruby, we're going to have to talk to you later to see if that's true. <laughs> that's one of his team over there. So um, now I do know that this, this kind of DNA of user experiences at the University of Newcastle and how you do your work, and it's not just the student experience, but you know, staff and alumni and the community that you operate in. And then when you look at the um, Newcastle, uh, University of Newcastle website, it's, you can almost feel the city, as you can see there, coming off through every page. Why is, why do you, why is that such a strong DNA? How does that make a difference to you? Well, I, I, think, I think at the moment, especially for us, that we're trying to really change that mindset around our potential students aren't potential students, they're potential customers. Mm. And, you know, you really want any customer, doesn't matter whether you're, you're selling, you know, hankies or whatever, you know, you really want them to be immersed in your product, you know, and so... We've got a really, really, really unique product in Newcastle. We've got a beach culture. We're a, we're a 
we were a dynamic, um, transforming city that used to be, you know, a, a, a blue collar BHP working town. We're now a tech hub. But also, you know, those students that used to be waiting at the front gate of the university mm. aren't there anymore. Yep. We've really got to fight hard. The whole sector's down yep. you know, in, in domestic um, undergraduate um, positions. So we really want to give them a sense of community, a sense of inclusiveness. Um, and we're a really cool city, you know. We've got... Done right, look at yeah. that. Yeah. And, you know, we, we made silver chairs, so... You know, I, th I think that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, who, who doesn't want to study, like, for instance, we have a campus, that, that beach Look shop, that's, that. that's Newcastle Beach. Our campus, our city campus is, is like, less than five minute walk from that. Do people turn up to class? Uh, well, you know, in our new space, in our new space um, campus uh, in, in, in Hunter Street, like, we've got surfboard racks and stuff like oh, that. Oh, nice. So we can go for a surf Get dream. the bikes. So, um, no, so assuming you've attracted them to this great lifestyle, great community feel, you then want to make sure that they make the right decision, which is what course do I decide to study? So you've been working on something pretty cool. How do you make that easier? Well, we wanted to, you know, you want to give every customer choice, you know, so, and you want to give them the best possible experience to be able to make a really informed choice. And, you know, choosing a degree is a really really important thing it's and it's like choosing a home loan it's like choosing a mobile phone plan it's it's really confusing you know so we wanted to be able to to to, uh, to also um, give our customers um, the best possible decision making process but also engage uh, you know their family we also get a value exchange of, 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 of a relationship with them with an email address or with a first name last name whatever so we build a comparison tool, like a degree comparison tool where you can, we took a few ideas from the commerce market where you can select a whole heap of different degrees, the stuff that you might be interested in, um, and it basically gives you just sort of, as you can see here, just sort of snackable bite-sized pieces of content about each degree. You can load as many as you like, it'll remember each of your selections each time you come back. Um, but what you can also do is, like, to get that real essence of being uh, immersed in Newcastle is if you put your first name, last name in there, we get a little bit of data. We start that relationship so we can then start making informed relationships and, and conversations. So you get a, you get a nice little, little degree guide as well, which, which gives you that... Hopefully this works, yes. Um, did, I tested it. <laughs> So, and it's completely personalised, you know, so um, you get that, you, you get a, a we, you know, taking that, taking that digital first approach to our publication suite, so that's also the other, my yeah. other family that I have in, at, at work, my creative team, and then, you know, merging the two teams or crossing the streams as you do in Ghostbusters and creating something like this. But at the end of the day, it's all about the customer and this thing, like, especially for our international agents, has gone crazy like the numbers are quite extraordinary so it's been it's been pretty cool well um this sounds as though it was a breeze surely there was something you learned about what you would do again and what you wouldn't do again what i i mean what i would do again is um continue that that deep conversation with with our customers um what i'd also do again is probably um, think about um, ways at which we could potentially do that better, um, ways at which we could essentially re uh, release it um, in, a, in a more timely fashion. But, but I think also what I'd really, what I'd really like to do again, I know we, we did spend some time, but, but it was also extending that relationship to, to the Swiss team. Um, for them to, we see the Squiz team, we've got Juan and Anthony and their respective teams, that they're, they're an extension of our team. Um, and if, and like to obviously basically continue that relationship as well. Oh, that's great. And, and we talked about this before, um, but do you, do you find that, that sometimes there is a fear of outsourcing or working with an external partner? I think um, initially when I when I joined the team, yes, um, 
but sort of being being a um, a creative at heart, like the best creativity, like we could imagine all of us coming up, we could come up with something pretty cool together, as opposed to just me thinking it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've spent. 25 years of my life locked in band rooms and, you know, the, the best music you write or whatever you do is, is with your friends and colleagues, you know. So, so extending, that, extending that team ethos um, to the Squiz team. Is, and it's also allows, allows people like Ruby and myself to, to you learn new stuff with, you know, working with other people who, who are way more experienced and better at what we do, you know. So... Having that collaboration is really, really important, and and I, and I, it's something that I'm I'm really proud of because that dialogue wasn't open when I first started, mm. <clears throat> and it's something that I really, really wanted to continue to work towards. Wow. Everyone's getting really comfortable, aren't you? Mm. We're being lulled into <laughs> relaxation, but now it's lightning round. <laughs> so, I will start off with AJ. So, you've talked about what you've worked on so far. What's next for the team? Right. So, we finish, um, we finish uh, our general art in the middle, of, the middle of next year. So, we get capacity. We get capacity into, in, in, into the team. So, for us, it's kind of, oh, what next is um, that personalisation piece. How do we... Uh, and if you ask the three of us what personalisation meant, it, it, you get three different answers. So, to be honest, we've got to figure it out for ourselves. We've got to understand what does personalization mean for us, for our customers, what's going to be useful for them as opposed to useful for us, uh, and then work to, to not just the technology, so, you know, we're looking forward to, to the roadmap um, and that coming to life, but we have to think about our organizational structure. Are we fit for purpose for when that tech, when that tech ro rolls in? Um, so that's probably a bit of introspection that we have to do over the next uh, mm -hmm. over the next piece and also integration is a big part a bit like um Atasha's point we are very siloed in terms of um different products with with very um specific purposes but tying that together uh, in a beautiful experience for a user is, is difficult so that's what's next for us as well so you talked about personalization mm -hmm. tracy is personalization one of the things that's next as well Yep, for sure. So we're rolling what does it out. Mean to you? Yeah. We're just uh, going live maybe today. Yes, we've gone live today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's an announcement for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so personalised notices for students, that'll be helpful. Um, uh, personalised news items and starting to understand again how they're using it, what comes next, a lot more consultation with students before we go too much further. Um, and then a little bit the same as what AJ was saying as well. As a university, more automation, better access to data, more um, an automation big. And and the the reason why you talk about personalization as the next step, mm. just jumping a little bit here, mm -hmm. um, is it important that you kind of start it with phase one MVP of the portal before you move to personalization versus ticking it all on? Yeah, we built it from the start knowing that we wanted to go down that path, so bringing in all the attributes that we knew about students so that we could do that, but we definitely weren't ready to roll that out when we went live. Um, we didn't, yeah, we just, that was definitely something to park. So we started with that in mind, but we wanted to get there first um, and with taking very small steps. Mm. Adam, what's next for Team Creative? What's next? Uh, look, I think for us, it's continuing that conversation. Um, you know, we, we, we're getting to know who our customers are, you know, with degree comparison tools and, you know, starting that conversation. But also um, extending that conversation depending on where our customers are coming from. So if they're coming from campaign stuff, um, you know, uh, having some kind of bot or something that they can interact with, Squiz product team, if that's on your roadmap, that would be nice uh, to have. Julie. So, so, there you go. She's listening. She's yeah. waving. <laughs> um, you know, and, and just deepening those, those relationships. We've dabbled in personalization, obviously, with the tool we personalized. We'll, we'll, we'll surface previously browsed, you know, degrees and products and stuff for, mm. for you know, second, third, fourth, fourth time visitors. But just, I think, enhancing that, that relationship and getting to know our customers 
um, at, a, at, a more, at a more granular level. Nice. Um, second question then. So there's a, a lot of cumulative digital experience here in this career of panelists. Um, what is the biggest trade-off or myth that you've found about making digital experiences work in the real world? Um, I'll start with you maybe, Adam. I'll shake things up a little bit. Um, biggest myth, I think the last, the last two years we've learned a lot. Um, biggest myth is to create uh, well, what we've found, to create really, really beautiful experiences. We don't have to push our team to the edge of mm. sanity, you know. Um, having that serendipitous moment of, of creativity, has, we've been robbed of that the last couple of years. But I think there still are ways of which that you can um, uh, have, have, have a, a, a rich team experience, personally as a leader, watching, watching the team um, create and um, produce awesome products is, is amazing. But I think, I think what, we, what I've learned is that um, you don't really need to push them because we've got partners like Squiz that, that we can speak to. Uh, Juan and his team and Anthony and his team that can help us along the way. Um, we did it open day. We've all had to do virtual open days the last couple mm. of years. You know, um, we built um, an, a, an open day online microsite uh, for 2020, which won an international case award. We got a bronze medal for that. Oh, nice. Um, that is so uh, And you know we did it. We did it all with partnering with Squiz. So um, the last couple of years, that's probably what I've learned the most is like you know, get help. <laughs> <laughs> get help. Um, that's a tagline if you ever got one. Uh, so, and what about you, Tracy? What's your biggest myth or trade-off that you found? Uh, well, the myth that got busted for me this year was that integration was easy because apparently ah. it wasn't. Um, but also, I think it. It would appear that uh, no matter how good it is, there will still be someone that will ring and say, did you mean to send that to me? <laughs> or even though it has my name on it. Um, so I think having that multi-channel um, approach, particularly for students, is really important because, um, yeah, different people will use things differently and no matter what we do in the portal as such, we'll still rely on other channels as well. So that's, yeah. Not yeah, one stop shop necessarily. One stop shop. Mm. All channels are open, always. Very much open. <laughs> and AJ, what's your big myth? Um, I think for me, so our mantra is certainly evolution, not revolution. And the myth that on, you know, the 22nd of um, December, this beautiful new system will be unveiled <laughs> and the world will be better. I just don't think that exists. So, what we've certainly done, and I think Gareth mentioned it earlier on that um, kind of big bang deployment is yes. so fraught with risk um, and you have to have got it absolutely right and that, that, it's hard to do. So that evolution of um, deploy something, get really robust customer feedback, is it working, is it not, and then evolve and it works better for two things. It works better for customers but also works better for the organisation as well because you're taking a really huge bet yeah. on, uh, on, something, on something being right. So for your stakeholders, once you've got a few um, wins under your belt, you get more trust and more credibility, and then you kind of get your ticket to play into into more more impactful things as well. I'm going to take that advice, Gav. Uh, phase one is just phase one for lots of things I do. <laughs> <laughs> learning, learning. So, lightning round, final question. Brace yourself. Uh, so. What's going to be the game changer in 2023 for, it could be for your team, it could be for, you know, industry or, what do you think, AJ? Uh, um, there's probably a lot there, but I'll stick with one. I'm a marketer and for us in 2023, with the, with the kind of the crumbling of cookies, it is so different to how you market. Um, so, you know, in university land, we're so used to getting a three or a six month cookie so you can track someone over a long period of time and show them different content, I'm sure there are different ads. Um, you just can't do that now. So Safari is already gone, Chrome goes next year. And um, Facebook changed their rules um, uh, 
over the last year, and we've already seen a massive difference in the attribution that we would have seen from Facebook last year compared to, to this year. Yeah, that, and that's just, that's just one channel. So for us as marketers, um, uh, it's going to be very different um, to how we marketed in, 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 in the last five, five or so years. So that's probably something that, that, that's top of mind uh, for, for us as we think through as we think through revenue. That's great. And Tracy, 2023. Well, thankfully, I don't need to get them in the door. I'm not in marketing. Um, but for <laughs> the sector as a whole, I think the, um, the Job Ready Graduate Package is definitely going to affect us all. Uh, we're going to need to do better in terms of supporting the students that we have and retaining them. Uh, and I think that will come down to not only the digital experience that they're having, but also what we can do with the data that we have to be uh, um, pre presenting them with um, support options much earlier on in the piece. Mm. Um, unis have traditionally waited until people failed before uh, reaching out to them or slapping them over the wrist or whatever, and that will not that will not float the boat. So that will that will be a big focus for us, um, and I think for all, everyone next year. That's an important one. And Adam. I think for us is just maintaining that relationship, really, really focusing on our unique geography, um, creating that really safe, inclusive environment because we do know our potential customers, you know, whether they're in grade 10, 11, 12, they've had a pretty traumatic couple of years. Yeah. Um, and we just want to make sure that um, whether it's a, a physical um, experience or their... Um, inquiring, deciding experience is just the, 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 the safest, coolest, most um, uh, interactive um, and inclusive in, in situ uh, experience we can give them because um, the industry's changing, looking at students as customers, you know, I said it earlier, you know, um, really trying to in, improve the way that, that we look at our, our customers and, and, and really forge a meaningful relationship with them. Even if they don't enrol, they might come back. We'll That's remember right. them That's and right. we can continue that conversation. That's right. Well, I feel as though my digital IQ just went up about 20 points. So, uh, and for all my smart Alec colleagues, no jokes on that. Thank you very much. So anyway, you shared so much today. Very different journeys on very different projects, but I, I, I said, I would guarantee some learnings, and I think all of us got something out of this, really. So thank you. Um, we might have about five minutes. I know. I know. So we, we will get there. Um, but just want to recap for, for the crew first. Um, key things that will kind of be a game changer in 2023. You mentioned integration. So connecting data and content silos, automating manual work, personalization in, in all its different forms, really using data in, in a world where there's cookie-less, in the cookie -less world, and also having the flexibility to leverage your existing, whatever tech stack you're using, whatever digital ecosystem you're using, and move at your own pace. Um, and the other core themes that I think we've heard today is, you know, the customers have more choice than ever, whether they're students or whether they're any of your customers, um, and really a seamless uh, multi-channel experience is a way to kind of connect hearts and minds as a brand and we need to start with our existing customers first. Um, you don't have to go it alone. Um, we are all facing like a tech talent drain at the moment. Um, reach out, work with a partner that you trust as an extension of your team, and it not just helps you get it done, get it done faster, but also could actually expand your team's own skill set, which is gonna be key to retain staff as well. Um, change fatigue is real. Over communicate, over communicate, even when you think it's enough. Lesson to self for myself. Um, and uh, also in reality, success in digital comes through evolution, not revolution. Don't eat the elephant. You know, Think about how you bite things up into small sizes, do things progressively, learn as you go, keep talking to your customers, and then optimize and then you go. So um, this has been great. Thank you so much. We have time for questions. If anybody has a question, come on. It's probably about a hundred years of experience here. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Any
any questions or even on, on Slido for somebody who's watching Slido? It's always the first one that's a bit, mm, as Adam's going, yes, mm. <laughs> No curiosity, no questions? Oh, oh, oh. oh there's one. Uh, if no one's asking another question, then I can ask one that's bothering me, and I'm sure lots of people in the room. Um, Andrew, you mentioned the great phrase, the crumbling of the cookie, which I would argue is probably reinvents 20 years of digital marketing, not five. Um, you know, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts about how you're addressing this step change in how we need to market to users? It's going to take a couple of things that we're doing on our side, and one is server-side. So we're building some server-side infrastructure that helps us combat that by using our own customers' data. So obviously, in a very pro obviously, we are very conservative, and rightly so, when it comes to using our own customers' data. But understanding um, the traits, attributes, we can, we, can build, we can build types that we can then use as marketing. Um, so you know, one example is we know that um, uh, the majority of our students come from within the catchment area of, um, of the north, northwest of, of, of Sydney. So that's kind of an attribute that, that we can use as a marker to say, okay, you're more likely to come to us if you're, if you're from, from there. So we're building a bunch on the server side that can help us, you know, help us do that. And we've been doing that probably for the last nine or ten months. So it's not a quick, uh, not a quick thing, but we're, we've been thinking about it for some time. Thanks for that question. Any other questions? Well, you don't have to worry. Oh, this, is that Tash? Is that you? Tracy, so you mentioned that news and notice personalization went live today. What's your next thing in personalization that you focused on? I feel like that's a trick question, Tash. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got to get them, uh, we've got to see how they, res they responded to. Um, the aim with the personalisation was to be able to deliver up notices because um, apparently students don't read their emails. Uh, so notices based on their campus of study or their program of study or what school they belong to or what stage of the journey they're at, so commencing versus continuing, that sort of thing. So we will um, roll those out and see how they go over the next few months. Obviously, we're right at the end of the semester now, so there's actually, hopefully, not a lot of traffic, um, but we will see how that goes and then we will need to build from now. Good, good trick question there, Tash. <laughs> Any final questions? All right. Well, as we said, we're between you and lunch, so lunch will be served soon. But just to let you know, the audience here have really happily um, said that they'll be happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn if you want to kind of chat with them offline. Um, so please do that. And please join me in thanking our panelists again, AJ, Tracy, and Adam. <laughs> I'll pass over to Ed. Wonderful. Thank you very much, panellists, and thank you, May. Can I have the... Thank you. Beautiful. I can't remember where we're, where we're up to. Um, yeah, we were going to uh, wrap, up, um, wrap up the session now So and head off for lunch. Uh, we've heard a lot of information, though, uh, this morning. Um, I think there's some key themes uh, that I'd like you to take away uh, with you. Um, that is that you've got a lot of power under the hood already. So there's a lot that you can do with uh, the, the technology that you have. Um, please reach out. Your um, key point of contact is uh, account manager. Um, but we've heard about other ways uh, that, are, that are coming along. So our product managers are going to be making themselves more available going forward. Uh, we've got plans for deep dives uh, as webinars that we'll be releasing uh, in 2023 as well. Uh, so more channels for you to get across there. 
uh, in terms of uh, getting, uh, uh, making yourselves aware of the new technology that we're releasing, so there's a lot on the roadmap there. Um, please make sure that you're subscribed. I'm hoping you all receive already. We send out a monthly customer newsletter. If you're not receiving that at the moment, uh, jump on the squiz.net website. Uh, we've just added a new banner at the top there that'll, that'll flash up the first time you, you re-engage, uh, and you'll be able to have an opportunity to re-subscribe to our communications. So we send out monthly customer newsletters. Uh, there's a six-monthly roadmap that's being sent out by Julie. Uh, Brettel and her team, um, so that's being updated regularly as well, so please um, stay informed there. Obviously, again, your account managers are, are keeping you up to date, but, but there's many channels that, um, that we're releasing information through. Um, in terms of uh, the partnership that we enjoy with you, we are here to help. So as strategic partners, um, uh, we've mentioned today digital deep dives. I've already had a, a couple of conversations just during the break with customers around those. Um, again, your, your account manager there is a point of contact. Book those in. We can come and, uh, and work through a, a customised presentation of our roadmap and where we're up to work with you, understanding what your, your goals are and what you need to achieve and how we can align uh, together there. Um, and, of course, there's a lot more in store from Squiz. So in terms of that roadmap and out into the future, uh, we're really committed to uh, the vision and the strategy that we've shared with you today around the composable DXP. Uh, bringing together the tools that you already have in place, plugging them into what we have, um, uh, and come as you are. Mm -hmm.